Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Planning Applications Committee meeting of the 21st of February. It's going 10.30. Can I ask everyone to remember to switch off or put on silent their mobile uh, uh, or electronic devices? And can I remind people that the proceedings during today will be recorded and will be made available later for public listening? Uh, can we have Cedar and, and apologies, please, Lucy? Good morning, everyone. We have 15 members present. We are quorum, And so far, I have received apologies from Councillor Blake, Councillor Hislop, and Councillor Maitland. Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Crothers are not present, but maybe along later in the meeting. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, can declarations of interest members? Pauline? Can you give numbers, please, Pauline? Okay, David. So, in number eight, I own land adjacent to this property, so I won't be attending number eight. And in 10 and 11, I have a predetermined uh, position reference to the McKee question on wind farms, so I won't be attending for 10 and 12. Thank you, David. Pauline, when you come back to give us the agenda items, can you also explain to the governance officer why you're declaring interest and you're not participating, please? Yeah, but the basis for it. Pardon me, sorry. Um, I, I have personal contacts with both of the families involved, Councillor. Thank you, Jim McComb. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item 7, one of the objectors has been well known to me for over 40 years, and in the circumstances, I will absent myself from discussion of that item. Good, and go back to members, uh, uh, Pauline, David, and, and you, Jim. On the agenda items that you've declared, do you intend to leave the room, or do you intend to remain and participate? Councillor Dempster, I'm more than happy to leave the room, if that's okay. Thank you. Fine, David. I, I think I stated that I'll leave during those items. And Jim? I will leave the room, yes. And Dougie Campbell? Uh, on item 10, I have met with the developer, and um, the developer has also spoken to the Labour group. However, I made it very clear to them that I would not, that I was on the planning applications committee, and I was not prepared to predetermine any decision on, on the application. I therefore do not think it is necessary for me to uh, leave the room for that item. Thanks, Elaine Dugge. Thank you, Chair. Item 6, I was approached last week by the applicant for this particular application. Um, I uh, haven't predetermined any view in this application and I will remain within the, the room. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Chair. As Secretary of the Labour Group, I uh, organised the meeting between the Labour Group and the, uh, the applicant on item 10. Uh, but we didn't declare any uh, uh, support or otherwise. Thank you, Jeff. Any other members? Ian? Uh, I just think, again, from a group perspective, I think all groups met with uh, item 10 when it comes to that. They approached all groups, so we did meet as a group and uh, spoke. But again, no, no predetermination was made in any way, shape or form. And I did have contact from item number 6, but I don't know the person, which I quite often get that phone randomly, the leader of the group, uh, just in regards to uh, being a member of the planning committee, so no predetermination either. So I won't believe in the meeting in any uh, for either of those, but just be open and transparent. Thanks, Ian. Any other declarations? That, uh, join? Well, thank you, Chair. Our group also met with these people, and again, we, did, we will not have not predetermined this issue. Thank you. Okay. Uh, these are all item 10. That's John Young. To Campbell, Elaine, Jeff. Oh no, Dougie's with six. John Young, Elaine, Jeff, and Ian Carruthers. For item ten, and John Martin. It's number ten as well. But the last time this was here, I was, I was actually put forward. A, actually right, put the forward. Group, the, the, the actually put forward. Group the, the, actually the, put forward. The NPA actually put forward. Had a, a Jim, hearing or a, a meeting Jim's with the finish. with the applicant at some time in the recent past, but no one has offered any support. Can I finish off what I was saying, Chair? Well, then, I am 10, but the last time this application was here, I seconded the amendment to it. 
but I don't think there's any bear in there now. Lucy will give you advice on that. Uh, no, it doesn't have any bear. Simple as that. No. Okay. Are there any other declarations of interest? Hey, David. Sort of point of uh, pedantry here. Um, is a, a declarable interest a factor? when we are not the uh, planning authority, when we're only a statutory consultee, as I believe you are on a major wind farm? I would suggest we are simply asked to state if we've had any contact with any individual or organisation and what that is. But Lucy will clarify that for you. The, is it necessary to have a declaration of interest when we are not determining the application as such, we are simply a statutory consultee? Um, I would say no reason why you shouldn't um, declare the interest at the start. It's always better, perhaps, to declare have it out there because it relates to an item on the agenda. No, not exactly my question, but we'll leave it for another day when I'll make it clear. David seems to have the answer for you. I, I would say yes because you're still declaring, the, um, you're still determining the council's position as to whether or not you're going to object to a Section 36 application, and that has quite a lot of bearing because if the Council does object, it automatically triggers a public local inquiry. So, yes, if you have an interest on Section 36 applications, I would say you do need to declare an interest. That's the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Now, have everybody got the declaration sorted out? I have a two. Agenda item four, a, because of my contact with the objectors, I stood down when this was considered last month. This is simply a continuation, so I'll leave the room again. And uh, agenda item 10, the Sandy Now Wind Farm, uh, I declared an interest in 2014 based on the fact that I sat at that time on a community liaison group uh, to determine how we would use the community benefit money that was coming to the community, and as such it could be argued that I supported the application. Therefore, at that time in 2014, I declared an interest in the interest of continuity and uh, Probity, I will do the same again. So I will leave the room on agenda item four and agenda item 10. Lucy, uh, we have minutes of the previous meeting, 17th of January 2019. Is this a true record, members? Agreed. Okay. Uh, can you confirm, Lucy, which members are entitled to determine agenda item four and then... Oh, no, sorry. I, we'll, have the, we'll have the process to go through now. This is the process. This is for members of the public and members of the committee. So Lucy, can you just go through the process today, please? The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The Chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representers who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee. Such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation. Applicants or their agents. Representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, excepting for national and major developments which by their very nature are more complex where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. 
Representers should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, for appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thank you, Lucy. The agenda items for speaking today are agenda item 5 through to agenda item 9. Item 5 is a major application with a five-minute opportunity for representatives. The remainder are free. So now, can you determine or, con or, or confirm who the members are, Lucy, that can determine this application agenda item four, please? Okay, the members which who can determine agenda item four are as follows. Councillor John Campbell, Councillor Ian Blake, Councillor Crothers, Councillor Fairbairn, Councillor Juicy, Councillor Hislop, Councillor James, Councillor Lever, Councillor Maitland, Councillor Martin, Councillor McComb, Councillor McKee, and Councillor Murray. Thanks, Lucy. I'll now hand over to Vice Chair John Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all those who turned up at the uh, site visit. Uh, I understand how emotive this application is, and I appreciate the level of restraint shown by most members of the public. And I'm sure they will show that restraint in here today. For those committee members who went on the site visit, I've asked Andrew to give a short presentation, and it is going to be short, he's nodding in agreement, uh, just to get members up to speed. Andrew. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yes, so it's just, um, just a quick... Um Flick through the sites really just to just to recap what the scheme was. Application sites um, is shown here with an aerial photograph on the left. Um, so these are the site photographs. This was the southern access point um, at the bottom of Queen's Crescent. And this is going into the site from that area. So this is looking north over the site and looking to the east. Again, that's looking north, so you can see the site between the houses on the left and the, the stone like wall on the right. It's an area where the proposed Suds pond is with the primary school in the to the right hand side there. Uh, and this is the northern part of the site. This is where the proposed access point was going to come into the site from the northern part. That's looking back south down the site. Uh, this is the area of the proposed roundabout, mini roundabout. Um, again, that's just a closer shot of it. Uh, that's where the access point would lead into the site. And that's, uh, that's the area where the access road is proposed to go. Uh, and that's opposite, uh, so that's the property Amworth House. Uh, the proposed site plan, uh, I did put some zoom ins just to recap. That's the northern part of the site. It's the middle part of the site with the access at the bottom of Queen's Crescent and the southern part of the site. It's a 3D image of the proposed uh, layout and housing. Um, we've got the mini, the, the tracking, which was shown at the last committee. You can go back to that for reference if, if anybody wants to do that. Again, there's some more there. Uh, proposed boundary treatment. Uh, effectively, it's a combination of fencing and boundary walls. There's an amenity space plan shown proposed um, amenity areas. Those in green are the usable areas. <coughs> Ones in yellow are a sort of more passive open space. Um, there's a landscaping layout that's been submitted. And this is the proposed square that leads into the site. Um, I'll flick through the elevations. Effectively, they're two-storey properties, um, mainly of semi-detached 
Uh, some like that uh, contain flats, which are slightly larger. Uh, some have brick appearance, some have got render to the front. And go back if anybody wants to look at any blocks in details and some cross sections through the site effectively what the site levels do they slope down from west to east generally so that's just a recap of the slides there thank you andrew members we are in session so i'll we'll open it up to members ian Thanks, yeah. I think firstly, apologies for not getting to the site visit. I just wondered if there was any more information. So, so I did miss that. I did, I did have intention, but got a delay in a job. Uh, so wasn't able to make it. Was there any more information in regards to uh, what, the outcomes of that? So what was actually discovered on the day? We spoke about traffic constraints, the congestion. So we've, we've seen again, maybe a, a bit more detail in regards to the plans and the layouts. I just wondered, the kind of, did any of the members that were there, what did they take from it? Did they, Fortunately, I wasn't there, and that was not to my advantage at all, Chairman. And if you just give us a little minute, Ian, I'm going to sit next to the governance. Apologies, it's uh, just to help me with assistance with the, the speakers and the order that they come on. Sorry, sorry, uh, Chairman. I suppose what I was asking is probably more to other members that were there, uh, or if you were there as well, Chairman, I'm not sure, but to try and get an understanding of the flavour of what the comments and relationship to the, 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 the constraints that were there. We've seen them in the picture. The site visit was around about the, the, the roads constraints, and but predominantly. There may, may have been, been other factors as well, the size and scale around about. I just wondered what, what actually came from the site visit. Would anybody be willing to maybe share their thoughts with, with, uh, with myself? Because unfortunately, I apologise for not being able to make the site visit. Well, I'm sure those members who were on the site visit will share their thoughts as they're uh, coming in to speak. So I've got Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, as you know, I seconded your motion to go on the site visit because I felt, uh, knowing the area a bit fairly well, that the pictures of the access and so on didn't really give the sort of physical understanding of what it actually is like when you're there. And um, personally, I have no problem with the development itself, but I do have concerns about access, and those concerns were reinforced by that Queen's Road is narrower than it looks on those um, on those slides. The other access through um, private land, which is owned by three apparently three different owners, it could be one of the owners of that land actually decides that they're going to refuse access across that land. So I do have concerns about the access, and I think there are concerns around the suds as well, and how, how safe that suds would be. Well, looking again after that at the, at the map that we were given, I'm not quite sure why access is being taken over those areas anyway, and why it wouldn't be taken at the road at the bottom of Queen's Road, whether access could have been brought in through that. So I do have anxieties about access, having seen it. Well... Would it help if I get uh, Ken to come in on the roads? Because uh, my understanding was that the, there's been a long-standing application for this in the LDP, and uh, the original access was to come off Queen's Road with a mini roundabout. But if you would like to sort of reassure members. Thank you, Chair. Um, the... Original access to the site was looked at in 2008, I think it was, when the planning application came in. Um, at that time, there was only one point of access considered for the site, and because of the positions of the roads that come together at the point where the developer had control of the land, um, the only possible solution was to look for something which wasn't a simple junction, and they came forward with a proposal for a mini roundabout, which the principle of which was agreed at that point in time. Subsequently, there was another application in 2014. That didn't take the principle of the roundabout any further. We've now got this application, and this is the first one which has got the option of two points of access. The reason two points of access was deemed preferable was because designing streets has got a presumption against cul-de-sacs. Designing streets is national planning policy, so wherever possible, 
we have a preference for two points of access that provide permeability. Um, in respect of the design for the roundabout, the, um, the roundabout that we've seen and the application that we've had to consider is the one that's essentially the original. So it hasn't been worked up beyond that point. You want to come back in, Elaine? I mean, just looking at the map, and unfortunately I hadn't looked at this when we went on the site because I, I would have liked to have gone further down Queen's Road and had a look at the road on the left-hand side. You see Queen's Road comes down and it forks. There's a road on the left-hand side which would appear to as if it could run into the site. And I'm not quite sure why that has not been considered. Would, would it help if Andrew puts that up on the screen? I'm not, I'm not sure that this road that I'm talking about is actually on... Because it's further down, it's actually, if you look at page 17, you'll see that Queen's Road comes off the Glasgow Road at Sanka, and then divides into Queen's Road and Queen's Crescent. The points of access are off Queen's Road and Queen's Crescent at the moment. But if you continue on down, down Queen's Road, there's a fork in the road and there appears to be a, a road to the left, which would lead towards the site. Now, that, I, there may be a good reason why that's not been considered for access, but unfortunately, as I say, I didn't, I didn't look at it when I was down there to try and find, to see whether that could, could have been a point of access. Yeah, it, we're actually here to determine the application as it is at the moment. We're not here to rejig how access should come into this site. Uh, so I don't know what more you want to add to anything, David. Really just to echo that, that uh, obviously you've got the application before you and it stands and falls on uh, whether you consider that to be acceptable and, and safe. Jeff? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I've got concerns about that uh, mini roundabout. That is a very tight junction to get into the site. Would an option be to either, it's not up to me, it's up to the applicant, purchase the house, which is adjacent to the, uh, the road. I mean, if you go down pedestrians and traffic mixing, that very tight junction, I think that's a concern. Or alternatively, having a one-way system in there, having an entrance there and next to the, uh, the, the, uh, the bottom of the, uh, the site. And I also have concerns about the uh, the suds. I mean, that area is obviously quite marshy anyway. If we're going to build up on that, it's going to channel even more water down there. And looking at the uh, the fencing, I didn't see any sort of security around that area, given that it's next to a uh, a primary school as well. That's also a, a significant concern. And there are obviously going to be uh, youngsters living on the uh, the uh, estate. Yeah, I know your concern about the the suds and all that, but it's referenced in the papers, you know, uh, that they all fall into the right category. Uh, as for fencing, well, uh, I suppose, could there be a condition on the application if it was minded to pass? If Scottish Water are going to adopt a sud scheme, then there is a requirement which they have that it be fenced off. Uh, obviously the issue is if it isn't adopted, but yes, um, if members were so minded, then that could be attached. Are there anybody else? Jim? Chair, can I just come back about the one-way system? Would that be an option? Uh, Ken? Thank you, Chair. And no consideration has been given to um, designing it as a one-way system. Um, it's not to say that it couldn't be, but primarily when we're looking at new developments, we try and make them permeable in all directions rather than you know, in, in putting a restriction that um, requires additional uh, measures to actually make it work. Um, we haven't consulted Police Scotland about that as an option either. And we would have to get Police Scotland con um, support before we were able to put an order in for that. So it, it hasn't been considered up to this point. It hasn't needed to be. Does that satisfy you, Jeff? Not really. Jim? Thanks, Chair. I've also got reservations about the access point at the mini roundabout. There is a further access immediately adjacent to the proposed roundabout, which is not highlighted on the plan. And that is the access to the small garage, which sits 
beside the, the proposed roundabout. So there are actually six potential access points to that roundabout. The, there is a garage beside the proposed road into the development. And that has an existing access. So that, to me, is an additional point of concern. Any more speakers? Or oh, David James? Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> if I remember correctly, concerns were raised last time by our, our representative um, of the objectors that um, a development of this size based almost solely on two-bed units wasn't appropriate. Now, as I understand it, if a commercial developer came here, we, we, we couldn't really question the market. Um, but there are a lot of um, public funds being drawn down to this, but, but still perhaps that isn't grounds for me to take that into consideration. However, there's a sort of wider strategic planning context with this being such a, a big development and using up a lot of the available land in, um, in, within Sankar um, perimeter that um, would one be able to take that into account, the fact that um, one might feel that although it suits this developer to maximise the amount of units, units of this size are not necessarily what is uh, needed in Sankara at this time. Well, that's entirely up to yourself. Uh, the application is in front of us and this is what we're determining at the moment. Ian? I just want, it's on a similar point. I did raise it last time at the last committee. It just is round about the local housing strategy, the demand, the need. It's maybe not appropriate for this committee, I'm not sure, because we'll look at that through the Communities Committee, I think it is at the moment, the Strategic Housing Investment Plan, but I did raise the question, aye, so I just wondered if it, if it was an appropriate point. I think it's, I understand where Dave is coming from, just in regards to, for me, because historically the knowledge and experience we've had with the Council, I thought it was a real shortage of demand, but maybe there is an absolute demand for this, uh, and when it comes to affordable housing and Scottish Government grant, Council grants, and so forth. I mean, I don't, if it's not appropriate, then just rule them out of order, Chairman. But if it is, I just thought that for something like this, uh, it, it may, it may, the, there's a direct correlation between what we are doing, Council, uh, strategically, and what's in front of us here. Yeah, I'll bring David in to answer that. Obviously, this is a planning application. We're looking at it on the planning merits. It's a site which is identified in the current local development plan for housing and in the proposed one. In terms of need, we can't really, as a planning authority, look at the, the size of the units. Um, if this came forward from Persimmon, Wimpy or something like this, and that they were proposing that, we would have no grounds to challenge it. In um, terms of the use classes order, a house is a house. It doesn't really make any difference. There is an issue about um, the, the ship. You're right about uh, that. That would maybe be the way to look for it in terms of whether it is something through the strategic housing uh, investment plan was appropriate. But in planning terms, we have a site that's identified for residential purposes. So in short, no, I don't think you could reasonably take that on board. If there's no more speakers, then the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. David? To clarify, when I asked my question, you said that was something I could take into account um, uh, Chair, but the, the officer seems to, if I understand him correctly, that I can't take my view that this is not an appropriate development to, into account. Well, you can take it into account if you consider that the particular layout and design of houses is inappropriate for that site. But you couldn't take the view that there wasn't a need for that level of affordable housing, if that's the point you're trying to make. No, if I, it is specifically the design and the layout um, or perhaps even the density of the unit, um, the density of the layout, then those are material considerations which you could take on board. You satisfied with that, David? I'm very confused because my, my, my feeling is that um, a development of this size with only two bed uh, units, or almost only two bed units, is, is wrong. Um, and I would, if I was allowed to, um, be minded to, to, to argue to refuse it on that on those grounds, but I'm not sure whether I, I'm allowed to. Well, I'm sure the decision of two beds, three beds, one beds is the decision of the applicant. Uh, if, if this is what's come in front of us, this is what we determine on. 
So if there's no other uh, questions from the floor, do, uh, Ian. So, sorry for coming in this last time I'll come in this, but I think my understanding is that the council has a, has a, a policy out with that, that says, listen, when it comes to affordable housing, this is the size, if the demand's there, we through the local housing strategy, I haven't actually looked into that depth, being honest, because I'm just looking at the application in particular, this is quasi-judicial, a, a, a regulatory pr process that we're going through. So I think the council has a policy elsewhere that says the demand is actually one, two bedrooms, threes, we've not got the same level of demand when it comes to affordable housing. I may be wrong with that, but I'm sure that is the case, but the, I think it's for David, like you said. You, you give him the governor's advice, it's fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll just go around the houses here with that one. Uh, the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions on the application in front of us. Jeff? Just from the point of view of governments, could we approve this subject to improvements in the access to the uh, site and the uh, safety considerations regarding the, uh, the suds? Or would that we have to uh, refuse it. David, you don't want to answer that? Well, Chair, I, I would just draw members' attention to, I mean, there's a number of issues. You will recall that in paragraph um, 4.31, which is on page 37, as officers, we did have some concerns about this. Certainly the roads officer was looking for a, a stage two safety audit, which in turn would better inform the design of the mini roundabout. Now, unfortunately, that wasn't submitted. Uh, there is a condition recommended, which is condition number nine on page 45, which sets out that basically all that would have to be done uh, prior to any development taking place. So effectively, if I'm picking up what you're asking correctly, that, that is covered by condition nine. But an option to yourselves, if, if you felt very strongly that you really, really needed um, to be satisfied that you had a proper and safe access, and that level of information was not currently before you, you do have that option to put it forward uh, as a refusal. So I mean, I, I would say really it's in the absence of that road safety audit and a detailed mini roundabout design, it's not been satisfactorily demonstrated um, at the stage that it can be safely serviced, and that would make it contrary to local development plan policy OP1E. Obviously, as officers, we've looked at it and we consider it's it's close enough at the moment, but with the subject to that condition nine, that it could be approved, but members may legitimately take a, a different view to that. Do you want to go back in, Jeff? Yeah, I do think we need to have that road safety audit done before it can be approved. David James? Um, yes, yeah, so I don't believe that such a large development should be so homogeneous in its uh, unit size. I think that's not, not healthy. So on the grounds of uh, site design and layout, I would like to move that we refuse this application. You have a seconder? I just, I'm, interested, I'm interested to hear the, the continuation of the views on the gas or road safety, because for why I wasn't on the site visit, that's where my concerns lead in particular. I think there is a genuine... Uh, I think, well, any reason is genuine up to the individual that proposes it, but I think there's a there's real concerns being raised really about the site access, the, the, the safety issues are there, the, the volume of traffic, pedestrian use, so on and so forth, uh, and an audit could probably just iron that out. So I'd be interested to hear what's been said in regards to that. But I do think, I'm very cautious about approving this today. <laughs> I don't know how far we have to go with the, the roads. Uh, I mean, other members have already raised similar concerns. I mean, you either pass it or you don't at the end of the day. I suppose it, for Chairman, it's me. I mean, I, I'm probably minded to refuse it, but more on the grounds of what uh, Elaine and Jeff are talking about. And David's said, listen, there hasn't been an actual road safety or audit in regards to this. That would give me the reassurance. If that was done, it, that actually the safety issues that are concerning me have been addressed or not, depending on the outcome of the audit. Councillor McKee. Hi, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm certainly uncomfortable with this uh, proposed roundabout. <coughs> the, there was a painting on the road that showed you the size of a roundabout. Now, that, I don't think that size of roundabout would be could, would fit in there, and that, that's my concern. I think if roads could come back with a design that's suitable to them for the large vehicles to get in and out there, I'd be more inclined to accept it, but I'd, I'd be happy to second the, 
<coughs> Councillor Lever at the present time that uh, yeah. we are at roads to come back with a proposed layout. Mm. The, the design on the road wasn't the roads department. That was particularly there. That was just to sort of confuse members when they were out and about looking at the site. Now, I'll ask Ken to come in because he's already done, did the road survey and as far as he's concerned, it seems to be okay. But Ken, if you would like to enlighten Councillor McKee. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, in respect of the consideration of the roundabout, which was looked at, as I say, some 10 years ago, um, the, the principles of the roundabout were assessed against a document which I think has been referenced by some of the um, other representat represent um, representatives, which is the Mini Roundabouts Good Practice Guidance. That's the document that we used at the time and it's the document that I'll be referring to now. In respect of the Mini Roundabout, they can they can be used in a variety of locations for a variety of different reasons. It could be to do with access, it could be to do with traffic calming, it could be to um, manage traffic flows. And we've got a lot of mini roundabouts around Dumfries and um, Nisdale and the whole region. Uh, they've been used in a variety of situations. They're used at any location where there is more than three arms required. Um, the majority are three and four arms. Um, the, there are some examples where there are um, junctions coming off or accesses, driveways in close proximity. As we have in this location, there are two accesses which are relatively close to the actual circular um, roundabout, but um, they're not actually on the roundabout, so they would be deemed, it would still deemed, be deemed to be a four-arm roundabout and not unlike several that we have in Dumfries. In respect of the design, the design was uh, approved in principle um, based on the information in that document. The expectation is that we should have a full design for that roundabout and that full design, in order to accommodate some relaxations that would be required, um, would probably change the, the nature of it somewhat. There are various options which are provided in the document that assist in respect of visibility, speed, and pedestrian movement, and things like that. And we would be looking for any design that came forward in the future to address those issues. Um, what I can't do is say what that design will be because that's in the gift of the developer to come forward with that. We would assess it. But there is satisfactory... Um, I have a view that a mini roundabout there, a satisfactory mini roundabout, can be installed that will be um, compliant that will bring speeds down that will provide appropriate visibility but it is clearly not going to be the roundabout that was inscribed on the ground at the day thank you ken uh, who? oh elaine thanks chair um i wouldn't second um councillor james's proposal because for me i don't have a problem about the design of the housing estate. I know Sankler well. I represented it for five years in the Parliament. I'm very often round and about on doors speaking to people. It's not in any way out of character with the town. And I wouldn't have any problem about the design. My problem is with the access. And it's not just with the access off the, mount, the, the mini roundabout. It's the access of private land, which is owned by three different people. And the police would have no authority if somebody decided to block that access. Somebody put their cars across it. Everybody, all the only access would be the mini roundabout because there would be no authority, I don't think, from the police to clear anybody out off that private land in order to give them access. So my concern, is, and it would be, would be with great reluctance um, to do this, would be to refuse on the basis of the, of the road layout, not on the basis of it, and so that if the applicant came back with alternative, an alternative road layout, which we felt was, was 
preferable that we would have the option then of, of uh, accepting the, the application. But I really am not happy with what I saw last week, at, you know, whenever it was. Uh, I'm really not happy with that. And I think, as I say, with great reluctance, I, pro I would propose that we refuse the application on the basis of the of road safety. Oh, before I bring David in, uh, members in mind, we have a motion put forward. Uh, I'll, I'll let Lucy come in. At the Through you, Chair, thanks. I just wanted to clarify, um, it wasn't quite clear to me, um, Jeff, did you propose a motion? Because um, I know Councillor McKee had come in and tried to second it, but it wasn't really clear that that was actually, you were actually proposing something there. No, I didn't propose a motion. I just expressed my concerns about the uh, the safety of the, uh, the the access to the uh, the site. I mean, it's necessary. I think possibly what we need to do is to carry out a full road safety audit, an up to date road safety audit, to assure ourselves that the the proposals are safe and to bring this paper back. I've got no problem with the development itself, other than the uh, safety of the uh, the suds, and to bring that, that back to uh, this committee for uh, final approval. David, that's what I thought. Thank you. Just to, to make clear about one thing, the, the access from uh, Queen's Crescent, we, we understand there, there are three separate owners all across that land, but that's actually not a planning consideration, that you can grant planning permission for anything anywhere uh, if you don't have the ownership of it. So, so that, that part I don't think would be justifiable, but the, the, the concern about the, the roundabout is a, a, a different matter. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm well aware that you can get planning permission on land that doesn't belong to you. Uh, what I am concerned about is this particular access could, because it is private land, could be blocked, and that is a road, road safety issue because that would drive all the, all the uh, transport in and out of the site onto the mini roundabout. David? Sorry, just to be clear, were you talking about the... The Queen's Road one, or the yeah, Queen's... The Queen's Crescent one, Queen's the Crescent. alternative access, which is private land. And it's not the fact that it's private land. That's not the issue. The issue is that A, it's very constrained, and B, if it was cl if it was closed, all access to the site would be through the mini roundabout and through that very narrow access along the side of that house. Mm. Okay, I'll take uh, Doug Fairbairn, Ian Carruthers... And Pauline Drysdale. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Pardon me, Councillor. I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, road safety is a major issue here. Absolutely, 100%. And the devil is definitely in the detail. The roads officer just stated there just now, and that is the point we need to go on, is that it will be up to the developer to determine what kind of uh, road safety measures are put in place. So I have slight objections with that as well. Take a year second, uh, the motion. No, I'm just saying I have objections with what's going on here just now, that's all. Ian. Thanks, Chairman. I'd be willing to second the motion for, for refusal in regards to the, the, the further audit, I think it's been mentioned in particular. I think that the, the private land, if for some reason that, that was not accessible, it'd be blocked and it'd be tantamount to a refusal in real terms. I would think so. Therefore, I don't think that's really an argument. I do think there was concerns raised round about the, the appropriate design round about the suds. So it's absolutely uh, for health and safety reasons. Maybe that should be, I think, for me. Well, if we have not got that level of detail, that needs to be, maybe if, if it was a future application, maybe if somebody's listening for, for nothing else, maybe that's a, I shouldn't even be saying that. But absolutely, if it, when it comes to the road safety issues, safety concerns, I have it. But I do think it's important that we see a further road uh, safety audit. So whose motion are you citing then? It was Councillor was it Murray, Elaine's? Was it? Elaine's, aye, Councillor Elaine's, Murray's. Yeah, Elaine's aye. motion, yeah. and you second it. Yeah. Thanks, Elaine. Mm -hmm. uh, Pauline. Thanks, Councillor Dempster. I know I can't um, vote I on can't this. Could I, could, I, could I just stop a minute? Pardon me. Was uh, Councillor Drysdale present at the rest of the meeting? Uh, no, um, so oh, right. sorry, you can't take part. Thank you for that, uh, John. Uh, you Apologies. Can't... I just I, I thought I could speak, but couldn't. No, I do apologise. No, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, it was pointed out that uh, you weren't at the previous meeting, so you shouldn't take part in this. Okay. Uh, Councillor McKee. 
I think so. What's, what's going through my mind is, could we defer a decision on this until the applicant comes forward with plans for this part of the road? This is, this is what's causing me the problem, and, and I've, I've got the same issues as everybody else. Can we defer it until, and give them a month? Yeah, well, I, I, I think we will be done on this one, Dave. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. That, that is, um, well, there's three options you basically have. The, the report recommends addressing that by Condition 9. Now, members might feel that's putting the, the, the cart before the horse, that you need to be satisfied that, in principle even, it, it can be done, therefore delegating de conditions to be discharged is maybe not good enough for you. You could defer it. Uh, I would have to check with uh, Ken Root on this, but I, my understanding is it will probably take several months to go and do a full um, stage two road safety audit and come in with a scheme. Uh, if that's the case, it, you would have to give a reasonable period of deferral, or you could decide that they get a free go within a year, and therefore the, the, the cleanest way is just to refuse that, because you don't know exactly what's going to be coming back in. Excuse me, you can't, don't interfere when I asked you at the beginning of this meeting. Please do not interfere. Do not interfere. I'll ask you to leave the room. Now, don't interfere when the members are going through these motions. Jim. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Lever also mentioned the point about the suds. Are we satisfied? that simply putting a fence around the Suds Pond would make it sufficiently secure. After all, it is immediately adjacent to a primary school. David, do answer that? A Suds Pond is an attenuation scheme. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it just holds back any surface water to allow it to diffuse down to the river in due course. It would only be full, and we would give various examples of suds ponds around the place, it would only be full in periods of very heavy rainfall. So it isn't going to be something that is a constant pond. Uh, but we, you know, we have had a look at this. We consider it is uh, an acceptable sud scheme. As I said, to get adopted by Scottish Water, which is quite challenging, to be honest. I'm, I'm not aware of many being adopted by Scottish Water. You must have a fence around it. But if members have concerns, then it is absolutely within your gift to go and have a condition that uh, it be fenced off. Uh, so that, that would, in my opinion, give enough security on that. If somebody wants to get into something, then they can, but you can't legislate for everything. I'm afraid. Uh, we have a, members, we have a motion on the table seconded, uh, well, motion by Elaine Murray, seconded by Ian Carruthers. Uh, are there anybody else minded? Lucy, could you go through the motion, please? Um, so I have. I'll get David to read the, the motion. Well, this is the wording which I, I put forward um, on the basis of what I was hearing from members is that. In that in the absence of a stage two road safety audit and a detailed mini roundabout design, it has not been satisfactorily demonstrated that the application site can be safely serviced and as such it's contrary to local development plan policy OP one E. Jeff. Yeah, I'm happy about that, but I think we also need to address the safety of the suds. You know, we're going to build over the the area which is naturally pre draining at the moment, we're going to put a hard surface over there. And what we could end up with is a permanent pond, so I think we need to address that as well. Uh, Elaine, are you happy to incorporate that in, as part of your motion? If it can be expressed, and you know, if uh, Mr. Sutty can suggest the appropriate uh, uh, terminology for that, I'm happy with his uh, what he said about the road safety, uh, and I'm sure that the developers have heard the points made in the debate and. If they wish to bring another planning application, that some of these points would be addressed. Well, if there's no other uh, options uh, on the table, then we in agreement with the motion. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I can confirm that in relation to item number four, members have decided to refuse the application on the basis that in the base absence of a stage two road safety audit and a detailed mini roundabout design, it has not been satisfactorily demonstrated that the application site can be safely serviced and as such is contrary to local development plan policy OP1E and also um, including the condition about the, the subs, suds would need to be concerned, um, would need to be addressed. <coughs> okay, thank you very much Lizzie. Just wait a few minutes for the members return to the chamber. <laughs> yeah. Oh, back members of the public that want to leave c can do so now while there's a wee interval, and otherwise we'll go into the next agenda item. Andy, chair, apologies for uh, being under council business at the start of the meeting. Just um, on item seven, I need to declare that actually um, I've met the applicant through his food bank, but I've, I'm, I still think I'm able to sit in the committee, but I think I need to note that interest. Thank you. I'm sure Lucy will note that, given you're in, you're in late. That's noted. Thank you. Okay, members, we come to agenda item number five, an application for the erection of eight wind turbines, one meteorolog meteorological mast, maximum height 80 metres, control building, substation and welfare facilities, formation of new vehicular access, junction onto public road and access tracks and formation of temporary construction compound and associated works without compliance with condition 8 of planning permission 15 stroke P stroke 3 stroke 0236 to allow for turbine tip height up to 149.9 metres from ground level instead of 133.5. The location of Glen Mucklock Surface Coal Mine, North Connell. Applications are full application. Reference number is 17 stroke, 2073 stroke full. Recommendation, recommendations to refuse. And the case for officer is Andrew Robinson. Andrew, when you're ready, just take us through your presentation, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah, the application has been submitted under uh, Section 42 of the Act. Uh, seeking non-compliance with the previous condition attached to a, an application in respect of turbine tip heights. Uh, the location of the site is to the northwest of Coconnell, uh, above the Dunmucklet surface coal mine. Um, the proposal relates to a, a previously approved wind farm comprising eight turbines, um, as laid out in, in the attached slide. Um, I'll just before going through the viewpoints, I'll just uh, point your attention to relevant wind farms in the vicinity of this site. They're listed in paragraph 1.19 of the report, but uh, uh, I'll just point out the key ones, really. So you've got the application site, which is in red, um, immediately adjacent to that, which is within the East Ayrshire Council area, is Lethens Wind Farm, which has been consented. That's just here. To the south of the site, you've got a Sandy Now Wind Farm, which has a consented application and an in-planning application. Uh, to the southwest of there, you've got um, operational Hare Hill and Hare Hill Extension, which falls within East Ayrshire. Um, to the south of Sandy Nell, there is the recently constructed uh, Sanka Wind Farm. And further to the south of there is uh, the recently constructed Whiteside Hill Wind Farm. Um, Aldeyside is a long-standing in-planning scheme, um, which is undetermined. Um, and then to the southeast, you've got the 20 shilling wind farm, which is a consented and an in-planning scheme. And then to the east of the site, you've got um, North Lowther Energy Initiative, which is currently um, to be determined by way of a public local inquiry uh, through Scottish ministers. And to the east of there is Harryburn Wind Farm in South Lanarkshire, which is currently undergoing a public local inquiry as we speak. 
Um, so in terms of the viewpoints, this is viewpoint two taken from the A76 on the approach to Kirkconnell um, from New Cumnock. Um, in terms of the ZTV, which is showing theoretical visibility potentially of turbines, uh, I'll just run through this once, what the colours mean. You've got white, which is no turbines. The yellow areas indicate one to three turbines. This is just of the proposal. Uh, green illustrates four to five turbines. Uh, turquoise is six to seven turbines. And the blue areas indicate um, eight turbines. Um, so this is the, uh, the viewpoint. So you've got a baseline photograph at the top. This is an on-site photograph taken um, more recently. And this is the, the Y line shows. The red is the proposed scheme. And the blue is the lessons scheme. Before um, you go any further, Andrew, yeah. can everybody see all right? I don't want the curtains closed. Can you close the curtains, please? Sorry, Andrew, just carry on. No, I hope that, that's fine. So the wire line is at the top of the slide and the photo montage of the proposal is, um, is on the bottom there. Um, further along the A76 approaching Kirkconnell, um, so from this viewpoint looking north on the A76, theoretical visibility of eight turbines. So on-site photographs at the bottom, the wire line at the top shows um, the proposal in red and in green this time is, is lessened. And that's the proposed scheme. Viewpoint four is just outside of Kirkconnell. So the top one shows looking um, looking south, looking west. So from this viewpoint, in this direction, this is the um, consented and in planning Sandy Nell scheme. And to the north, you'd be looking towards the proposed site. So that's just to recap which direction we're looking, visibility. And that's the proposed scheme there. And on this montage, there's also one showing um, with the Lethen scheme as well. This is on the approach to Sanka from the south. Um, so the top one is uh, looking southwest. So you'd have the 20 shilling wind farm, um, Whiteside Hill, and Sanka. And then looking to the north, you've got Sandy Nell scheme. Hare Hill is, is just here. And this is the proposed site up here. And that's the direction we're looking in. And that's the scheme just there. Uh, this is taken for Kirkconnell Railway Station from the bridge. So that's looking to the uh, southeast. And the southwest, you've got uh, Whiteside Hill, Sanka, and Sandy Nell. And that's the proposed uh, scheme with the Y line with Lethens Wind Farm. That's the direction we're looking in. And that's the proposal just there. And this is just to the southwest of Kirkconnell. So again, the top side is looking in a direction towards Sandy Nowen Farm, the bottom one towards the application site. Um, that's the direction we're looking in, so it's looking to the north towards the site. Um, there's some on site photographs there. And that's the proposal. Okay, the next two slides are from the Southern Upland Way. So the first one is from the southwest of Sanka. So the top one is looking uh, looking to the east. That's towards the North Lowther um, scheme. Um, to the south is looking towards the 20 shilling scheme. And then looking to the west is, is looking towards the recently constructed uh, Whiteside Hill and Sanka Wind Farms. Here's Sandy now, and here's the application site. So recap, that's the direction we're looking in. And there's the scheme just there. So the photo montage is showing the scheme there. This one's a bit closer to Sanka on the approach to Sanka from the uh, from the northeast. So this is on the Southern Upland Way. That's that's showing what uh, what the viewpoint is. And again, we're looking. This is the application site on the bottom here with the wind farms I've previously mentioned just on the top. 
So looking northwest towards the site, and this is the uh, the viewpoint. Um, within the settlement of Kellerholm, so this one's taken effectively um, at the Brown Brothers. Um, and there's the application site. And the final one is from uh, Sanka Railway Station. So again, looking west, you would see southwest, you've got the uh, Whiteside Hill, Sandy Nell Cluster, and then moving to the application site. And that's the proposed scheme from there. Um, you'll note in the report there's been concern raised about cultural heritage from uh, the St. Connell's um, Church, which is located just here. So that just gives you a bit of a, an idea where it's located. And that's the wire line uh, from that particular feature. Um, so after assessing this application on its, on its individual merits, officers consider that the um, proposal to increase the tip heights would exacerbate significant effects in terms of landscape and visual amenity and on cultural heritage to an adverse degree. There's also an outstanding objection from Glasgow Presswick Airport as well. Um, regards being had to the benefits of the scheme, which is in paragraphs 4.78 to 4.84 of the report, but they're not considered that these are a sufficient way to outweigh the adverse issues and non-compliance with the development plan, and therefore the application is being recommended for refusal. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, members, questions for the case officer, Councillor McKay and then Councillor Murray. Just, <coughs> just on par <coughs> paragraph 1, page 53, by reason of the number, scale and location of the proposed turbines, it's considered the proposal would give rise to significant adverse visual impact. Now, we've raised this issue, this issue quite a number of times in these planning applications. Have we now got authority that we can address these issues? Andrew? The uh, reference there is to um, the recommendation from officers for the previous application, um, which came to the Planning Applications Committee in, in 21st of June 2016. So that was the recommendation. That's just listing what that recommendation was. Ultimately, a, a different decision to that came on the day. So that's really all that that paragraph is is indicating. I think fundamentally, Joe, the decision lies with you. You know, I have Councillor Murray and then Councillor Campbell. It's just a, a niggly little point in 1.7 on page 52, which states that the uh, proposal 15P 30236 received planning permission on the 16th of May. 2017. As far as I recall, um, that was just after the elections and we didn't actually have a council until the 23rd of May 2017, so I don't see how could there could have been a planning applications committee. I think actually the appropriate date for that was the 21st of June 2016, when it was passed by nine votes to eight. I would agree with that because I was in hospital at the time. <laughs> Robert? Mr Chair, I'm, as a veteran of the previous application, I'm quite happy to confirm uh, the dates stated in the report are correct. It did go to the Plan and Applications Committee in 2016, but because the members were minded to grant it, subject to, amongst other things, a Section 75 legal obligation, that took some time to arrange and sign off and get registered. So the actual formal issue of planning permission didn't take, in, take place until 2017. But we were acting on a committee instruction from 2016, yeah. Very helpful, Robert. Thank you. Hey, Dougie Campbell. Thanks, Chair. Um, 2.5, the objection by uh, Glasgow Pressway Airport, um, to my mind, that's, that's uh, significant. Um, however, uh, there's only reference to a, a likelihood that the turbines would be visible to primary radar. Did, did Glasgow Airp Pressway Airport go into any more detail on that, Andrew? Or, you know, just to sort of... Um, give us a, a better indication of the implications if the application went through. Andrew? Um, no, that, that was their response in, in December 2017. Um, we did, I did send an, an email to Glasgow Presswick Airport towards the end of January just to ask them to clarify their position of whether anything could change. And the advice we got was, was their objection is still standing. Um, but they haven't gone into greater detail. My presumption would be is because there's no mitigation scheme being agreed with them for this new scheme. Um, but that is effectively the level of detail they've gone into. Thanks, Dougie. 
Any other questions for the case officer? No. In that case, we have one registered speaker. The applicant, uh, Mr. Alan Wilson. Alan, if you'd like to come forward, please. Uh, you you will be given five minutes to address the committee. I will remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And if you'd be kind enough to wait, in case members have questions for you, I'd be grateful. Just whenever you're ready, Alan. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Planning Committee. By way of introduction, my name is Alan Wilson. I'm the Energy Director for Buclew. As such, Glen Mucklet Wind Farm is one of the projects within my portfolio and would therefore like to address members today on matters that have been raised in the Planning Committee report. Could you put it on to the next slide, please? Thank you. The Glamuckluck Wind Farm has already been granted planning permission to build eight turbines up to a height of 133.5 metres. And what we are asking for in this Section 42 application is to vary the tip height limit up to 149.9 metres. So why are we asking for this change? Well, the reason behind making this application is that turbine technology has moved on somewhat during the intervening period when the project has been awaiting a grid connection to be developed, consented, built and energised by National Grid and Scottish Power Transmission. Increasing up to 149.9 metres will allow the installed capacity of the site to be increased from 25.6 megawatts up to 33.6 megawatts, which represents an increase of 8 megawatts in the installed capacity. Given that the project is committed to provide community benefit funding of up to £5,000 per megawatt, if approved by members, the increased tip height would increase community benefit funding by £40,000 per annum, given a total community benefit fund of £168,000 per annum. The increased scheme will deliver sufficient power uh, to supply the equivalent of over 28,000 homes and provide a reduction in CO2 emissions of almost 40,000 tonnes, both of which are an enhancement of some 25% versus the already consented scheme. Could you push on to the next slide? Thanks. Moving on to the issues raised in the report from the basis of the re recommendation for refusal. First of all, the Glasgow Presswick Airport objection. They have now raised an objection to the scheme, uh, although there is a suspensive condition in place and that would appropriately deal with the concerns of Glasgow Presswick Airport. The airport themselves now have installed a new thermal radar which is capable of mitigating the potential impacts and it's merely a commercial negotiation that needs to take place uh, to conclude matters. To date, the airport has not been willing to engage with developers on a one-on-one -on -one basis, so a collective group of developers is being formed, of which we are one of those, uh, seeking to meet with uh, Glasgow Presswick Airport and advance the commercial discussions with them. Should members approve the tip height increase, the matter will be referred to the Scottish Ministers, who will determine if it's necessary to call it in on aviation grounds. On the landscape architecture and archaeological points, I would just like to point out that, that the committee uh, were recommended to refuse the original application on these grounds and nothing on that front has changed in this application. So I would ask that members take a consistent view with how it was uh, interpreted last time round. And on the, the landscape architecture point, uh, I would say that the, the assessment that has been undertaken in the slides that you have already been taken through assume a baseline position where there are no turbines at Glen Mucklock. And I would stress that at, th at this point in time, the, the scheme has already been approved with 133.5 metres, and that what we should be assessing here is the impact of that additional tip height increase, and not the baseline position being that there are no turbines there. Furthermore, I would also just like to point out that the, the scheme immediately behind us, from a landscape and visual perspective at Lethens, has now been successful in granting Section 36 consent in the intervening period. Uh, that scheme consists of 22 turbines up to a tip height of 176 metres. Uh, so that, again, should be taken cognizance of in the, the landscape and visual point of view. And, and finally, if, if I can just say that I don't believe there are any discernible difference in the views from the A76. Yes, you will see the turbines, as you can see on the screen just now. That shows the scheme as consented. And if we just move on to the next slide, that shows the difference in the scheme. So I would argue that there are no discernible differences between the two when you're driving along the A76. Uh, the scheme has enjoyed support from, from the local community and continues to enjoy that support. So I would ask that members uh, would, would, would support the scheme and see it get, uh, getting the approval for the Section 42. And thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Alan. Any questions, uh, Elaine? 
I just ask you already have a consented scheme. If uh, planning permission was refused for this scheme, would you go ahead and uh, build the con already consented scheme? The, the scheme itself, as you say, does have consent, but turbine technology continues to move on and evolve. Uh, and that has certainly been, been further uh, reinforced by the fact that the removal, removal of subsidies for, for wind, pro, wind projects. So turbine technology will continue to advance. And, and I'm just keen to point out that that is the reason why that we are pushing. No, that that, that wasn't actually the reason for my, my question. My question really was, what were your intentions? So is the scheme going to be built anyway? But your preference would be to build, build it with a greater technology? The, the, the scheme will be built. Uh, Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Wilson, would you agree that the proposed scheme is virtually contiguous with the 22 turbines at Lethens? When both of those schemes are built, it will look like one wind farm for me. They, they are immediately behind. You can see the forest uh, in the background there, and that is the, the location of where the Lethens scheme is located. So it will appear as a 30 turbine wind farm? I, I, if, if their scheme is built as well, I can't, I can't speak for, for the, the, the Lethens development. It's, it's a bank's renewable scheme. Uh, but if they build their scheme, there will be 22 turbines behind the eight at Glenmuckler. Thanks, Jim. John Young? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Wilson, it's interesting that the additional 16.4 metres, which is over 50 feet, you're asking for an increase. Is that solely responsible for the 20% improvement in energy output, or has turbine technology also moved on and you have more efficient turbine generating systems within the hubs? The, the, the larger rotor uh, diameter will then allow it to capture more wind as it passes through through the site. So you will have both an, a greater installed capacity but a greater rotor diameter to be able to then capture that power. So I don't think you've really answered my question. Is a 20% increase in energy output from these uh, larger turbines solely due to the increase of almost 50 feet, over 50 feet in tip height? Well, yeah, the, the, the 133.5 metre scheme is based on 3.2 megawatt turbines, whereas the 149.9 is based on 4.2 megawatt turbines, if that answers. Thanks, John. Jeff? It's not a question, Chair. Just could we flick between the um, visual here and the, uh, the previous one just to see what the difference is again? You talk about the applicant's visual, just the, the two immediate adjacent to each other. Can you do that, Alan, please? Can you just flick them back and forth? Can you do it regularly, Andrew, please? Thank you. Right, Jeff. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, Alan, if you kindly take it. Oh, oh sorry, I have one more. Elaine. Uh, a brief uh, question. It really comes on from what uh, Councillor Young said. Uh, we have another planning application uh, in front of us today where an increased uh, output has been achieved by an improved mechanism within the turbine rather than an increase in turbine height. And I just wondered on the back of the conversation previously whether or not you had looked at the possibility of improved technology within the turbine rather than just increasing the height. Uh, uh, it's not really fair to speak on another applicant's uh, scheme that's put forward, but uh, if I understand what others have looked at, it's to maintain the same height but go with larger installed capacity turbines which effectively drives the turbine blade swept path closer to the ground, which, uh, from my years of experience in the renewables industry, is, is not advisable in the sense that it, you will have a wind shear effect where you would then see a, a greater difference in wind speed across the swept path from the bottom to the top. And when you see that difference in, in, in wind speeds from bottom to top of the swept path, it will manifest itself as a vi vibration through the powertrain and thus leading to early component failures in the power tree. 
Okay, with any other questions, additional questions? In that case, this time, Alan, if you'd like to take your seat again, please. Okay, right, members, we're now in session. Oh, you want the curtains open? No? Archie. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, actually, the last two photographs were pretty useful uh, with respect to this, this application, um, although they are the, the actual applicant's uh, photograph. I think in, in, in this case, Chair, when you look at the, the opportunities going forward for energy in, in this part of the region, obviously we would like, personally, I would love to see a brand new nuclear power station, but that's my personal benefit. This is not this application. Um, looking at the, 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 the um, committee paper in front of us, I looked at that compared to the previous one as well, and I'm looking at particularly at 1.8 on page 53, with regards to this uh, application. And I'm of a mind to follow that 1.8. Um, again, I think it was certainly somebody within the, the planning app. I was, I was certainly on the app, plan application previously to move that we do actually approve this application on the reasons that are in 1.8 again. Um, and I would so move, Chair. Thank you. If you have a seconder, I'll then check just to make sure it's competent. Uh, Andy, you're going to second that? I'll second that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, While David's working, well, it's competent or not, are there any alternative proposals? David, members are unanimously determined to agree this, uh, but can you just confirm that the motion and amendment is appropriate? Uh, Chair, well, well um, given that that was actually considered a, a competent motion last time round, I could hardly say it's not this time. Chair McComb. I'm prepared to move that we go with the recommendation, Chair. Okay, do you have a seconder for that? I'll second that, Chair. John Campbell, okay. In that case, we'll go to the... Go to the vote, Lucy. Lucy will eventually remind us what the motion is. The amendment's quite simple. Uh, no, Councillor Driver yeah. put forward Driver, the motion, Councillor so Ferguson, Ferguson seconded it, yeah, and then Councillor McComb, yeah, uh, the refusal, uh, uh, sorry, the officer recommendation seconded by Councillor John Campbell. Okay, I've got a Robert. motion put forward. Well, Lucy, we've got Robert wanting to give some information or advice before we go there. It was just again looking back at 1.8, we've now got a Glasgow Presswick Airport objection to this case, it's not an that subjection, but I think in all other, other respects, that, that reasoning holds good. So we're looking at, instead of NATS, we should have Glasgow Presswick Airport objection there. Right, and I take it we'll have a, we'll have a condition if it's approved that uh, all matters are dealt with. Andy? Just for clarity, what's the difference? Because I thought the national was the national uh, system that uh, all, air, all aircraft are guided by. So surely that's the that, that's the priority service. The, there is a difference. Um, basically, because Glasgow Prestwick Airport is a self-contained airport, they have the power to actually say anything about their particular air safety. NATS is the national body. Uh, one thing I should probably clarify, um, Mr Wilson said that it would need a referral to the Scottish Ministers. My understanding under Circular 3 2009, that isn't the case. The only ones that need to be referred to the Scottish Ministers are applications where it's involving uh, one of their um, their own bodies for the Scottish Government. Now, the Glasgow Presswick Airport isn't uh, one of the key agencies in that regard, so my understanding is that you would be able to just determine it. Are we all satisfied in that, uh, Ian? Actually, thanks for that. 
I took, took it there. We'd, we'd go to ministers after this for the DPA. So in regards to, to see some clear, I'm in favour of uh, Archie's proposal. I'll be quite open about that. 1.8, I imagine they were attached, attaching conditions uh, of a sort to the, to the original plan application. So we're confident all of those are still needed as per or have some of them been satisfied already? I suppose that's my only question, Chairman. Have some already been satisfied? Are they just to carry on or do they all have to be revisited? And if they are, are they attached as conditions as part of the motion? I take it all conditions are still extant or outstanding from the previous permission and it's already been clarified it's now not in that it's Glasgow Airport. But David, can you just satisfy Ian, please? Yes, sir. well, it is a whole new freestanding planning permission, so all the, the same things would need to be gone through and covered. Obviously, we'll go through it and if there is anything which has changed and um, is no longer applicable, then we will amend it accordingly. But um, the... Sorry, there was one thing that struck me about that. Um, yes, there was a section 75 before. We would, whilst that is in place, we would need to amend that so it's very clear that it referred to this planning application, not the previous one. So the work has been done on it, but it would still require to, to have an amendment to it. That do, Ian. Everybody is satisfied now? Yeah, okay. Lucy, go to the vote, please. Okay, I have a motion put forward by by Councillor Drybra and seconded by Councillor Ferguson to approve this application based on the reasons in 1.8 of the report but with conditions and also an amended section 75 and I have an amendment by Councillor McComb seconded by Councillor Campbell and to go with the recommendations in the report and to refuse the application. Are we ready to proceed to the vote? Okay. Uh, just to clarify for the record, I think the amendments from Councillor John Campbell. Thank you. I could all know that's John Campbell. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor John Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Ian Crothers. Motion. Councillor Drybra. Councillor Drysdale. Councillor Fairbairn. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Giusti. Motion. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Young. Motion. And I can confirm that the motion carries with 12 votes to 4, and therefore the application is approved. Subject to conditions, Lucy. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Hey, thank you, Lucy. We go on to agenda item number six. This is an application for the erection of dwelling house at Land at Mark Farm, Glengarp, Twynham. The application types planning permission principle. Recommendation is to refuse. The reference number is 18 stroke 1680 stroke PIP. And the case officer is Carla McQuinney. Thank you, Chair. Okay, hey, just take us through your slides when you're ready, Carla. Thank you. The principle of this proposal falls to be considered under policy H3, housing in the countryside. In this instance, the first criteria is applicable, which, is, which requires the application site to be within or well related to a small building group. Mark Farm Steading is not identified in the small building groups list. However, following a site visit, the group of dwellings consisting of <coughs> Mark Farm, the Barn House, Buyer Cottage and the Mark are considered to be well related to each other, create a sense of place and are capable of being viewed as a group in the landscape setting. As such, it is recommended that Mark Farm Steading is added to the list of small building groups. Notwithstanding this, the inclusion of a small building group in the list does not mean that all development proposals will be considered acceptable. The application site is not an infill site and there are no natural boundaries such as an established hedge, 
tree belt, woodland or dry stone wall. Therefore, under the terms of the supporting supplementary guidance, the application site is not considered to be within or well related to a small building group. The steading is in the position of the red pin. <clears throat> it's to the east of Gatehouse of Fleet and approximately two kilometres north of Twynham. We can see the application site outlined in red. The Mark Farm steading is to the east of the application site and Mark Cottage is to the west. The proposed block plan shows an indicative footprint of the proposed dwelling. The application site boundary is marked in red and the application site is currently in mixed agricultural and equestrian use. Um, this is a view um, looking up the U29S uh, public road and you can see at the very top of the road there, um, you can see the dwelling which is the barn house. Um, looking first at the dwellings that are considered to form the small building group, we've got of Mark Farm steading. We have Mark Farm, which is um, to the north of the group. Um, in the forefront of the photo there, we have the barn house and buyer cottages to the rear. This photo shows um, the barn house. Oh, sorry. Looking eastwards from the application site, we have Mark Farm, which is to the left. The barn house is in the centre, and the Mark is the larger dwelling to the right-hand side, which you can just see the roof off there. The U29S separates the Mark from the other dwellings that are um, considered to be, to be part of the group. This is looking across the application site, which comprises of an open field. This is looking northwest. The line of trees form the boundary with Mark Cottage. And we can see that Mark Cottage is, well, you can't see. Mark Cottage is on the other side of the line of trees. Um, you can see that this dwelling is distinctly separate from the rest of the dwellings in the group and it's not considered to be part of the group. The final slide shows four diagrams from the Housing and Countryside Supplementary Guidance showing the differences between acceptable and unacceptable sites. As shown in the lower two diagrams, open two sites with no natural boundary are considered unacceptable. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Caroline. Just a remaining case of any questions for you. Questions for the case officer? Ian? Actually, I think this is quite an interesting case, actually, when you see it. I wonder if you just go back to the last slide, Carla, please, if that's possible. Yeah. Because when I read the report, is it... Uh, Slide at the top right hand. No, no, where am I? Where am I in it? It's, it's when I looked at Mark Farm. No, so it's top left hand corner actually. You, you, you've got a site that it's, it shows you as a, an infill. Again, it's, but obviously there's, there's distances and so on and so forth, which would. So I'm not exactly clear from. I just wonder uh, from your perspective and the guidance that, that we have as a, as a, as a council. Because when you look at Mark Farm and Mark. There's been a relationship there at some point uh, because mm -hmm. of the, the names, obviously. So you'd think it would form part of a similar or the same uh, small building group mm -hmm. when you're looking at the plan itself. So I just wonder, from your perspective and the guidance that we have, when if you could put it into context, why is that? Gap, is it the gap that creates the fact that it's not the building group? That's yeah, it's the gap. I think the gap, the distance between um, the group of dwellings and um, Mark Cottage, or um, I think it's been called Corner Cottage. Um, the distance is significant and ordinarily an infill site that would be considered acceptable would be enough space for maybe one or two dwellings. The, with, the, with the scale of the dwellings that are on the site, I think the distance is um, too great to be considered an infill site as such. Thanks, Carla. I've got Dewey Campbell and Andy Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to remind the committee that I declared a, an interest in relation to this application. Um, However, there was uh, something that the, the applicant um, said to me, which I, I want to explore with, with Carla. Um, if, I, if I'm stepping beyond the realms, please uh, let me know. I'm sure you will. But 
Carla, the, in the report, there's a couple of references to 40 metres, um, that the, the proposed development would be 40 metres from the small building group. Mm. Now, my understanding is that there was some discussion between the applicant and another planning officer in terms of the position of the house in this plot of land. Yeah. Would, would a shorter distance to the, the small housing groups be favourable to the applicant? Um, this 40 metres, you know, I'm thinking, well, what the distance was just 5 metres or 30 metres, you know, or, Mm. Um, would that um, have a bearing on your decision to Mind, Dougie, we are trying to determine an application it's before us, no get into a discussion. If for whatever, whatever reason this is refused today, the applicant can, can engage in conversation again. Or, 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 and I think the other thing that Carla made quite clear is the amount, the, the amount of land between the two properties is considered inappropriate. Therefore, it should really be all in where within that piece of land the new application sits. If it's, if it's inappropriate, then it's inappropriate. But Carla, within reason, can you help Dougie? Because this is an application before us. So yeah. I don't want you saying if it comes back next week, we're, we're two feet shorter, it'll be all right. Yeah, I understand the point. Um, I think it's difficult to say because each site is looked on a, in each instance, it's looked on as a, in a case by case basis. Um, if the if the dwelling house was if the proposed application site was closer to the group of buildings that were that we would consider to be marked farmstead in, um, maybe just if I go back. Oh, sorry, that's it. Sorry. Um, the block plan. So if it was closer to to say in between. The, the kind of the area that's defined as a paddock there, um, there would still be no boundary to to allow that to be considered an infill site. It would be on the edge of the group. This this case is particularly difficult to assess because they're not. The, it's more of a cluster of dwellings as such. It's quite an informal layout. And ordinarily, when we look at a small building group, it would be, um, you know, a kind of um, a group of dwellings set in a line or in a crossroads and it's kind of it's easier to assess um, but if it was moved closer in short it, I don't think it would be considered acceptable because there is no natural boundary and there's not complementary development on the other side of the road to be considered uh, as a rounding off of the group Thanks Carla uh, Thanks Chair um, kind of the same thing Carla um, mm -hmm. if if you, could you go back to the local guidance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Carla's already said because the distance between the two properties are too great. What you would finish up, we need doubt, it would be another application, another application until they joined up together. I know that that's what we're, we're considering today. You have an officer's opinion saying that the distance is too great. With respect to you, I'm asking what would happen if that had been a semi-detached house, it wouldn't have changed it at all, because it would, it would have severely... I'll get David to help you. Again, it is a case of having to look at the application that's before you, and not, not hypotheticals. What you are looking at in the top left-hand corner there is a clear linear development running along both sides of a road, and you've got a gap site sitting between between the two of them. Now, I was mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
that that clearly is a gap site because you've got two other developments and this is an infill between those ones. The point Carla was making is there is no logical boundary to the west. Once you start moving that house, the next thing you've got is quite a distance away and that's Mark Cottage. So basically we have had a close look at this. We do feel it's a small building group, but just because it's a small building group, it doesn't automatically follow that any additional development is going to be acceptable. Any other questions for the case officer? Okay, we've got registered speakers now. We have a uh, Janet Gibson. Janet, would you like to come forward, please, and just have a seat? Janet, in this instance, you have three minutes to make a presentation to the committee. I will ask you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion, and if you just wait until members have questions for you before you room your seat, that would be great. Thank you. There is no need for housing on this site, nor in the middle of a field. The application doesn't comply with policy H3 and the LDP guidance, nor does it comply with policy OP1 for most factors, nor does it comply with policy OP2 as it would force a change in rural character and ruin the highly distinctive sense of place and culture and landscape with which we all identify. Flooding in the field and in Mark Corner Garden occurs already. Flooding would increase as the water supply to any new building in the field area chosen would drain downhill after passing through a septic tank. The extra effluent would be added to the annual flooding in the greenhouse and fruit and vegetable growing area. Is there an increased health risk here? Scottish Planning Policy, the 2009 Flood Act and Policy IM7 require the avoidance principle as the most sustainable flood management. The added risk of detrimental effect would also negate Policy IM9. The written history of Mark Farm starts in the early 1600s. The history of the Port Patrick to London Drove Road starts even earlier. This drove road passes right by Mark Farm. It is designated a Scottish heritage path. It's an important route linked to core paths and rights of way. It is the old postal route through Gatehouse, was once designated a military road, and was the route taken by William of Orange on his way to Northern Ireland. A walking route and amenity for locals and tourists. It is a financial tourism asset. This stone-walled farm in the pastoral drumlin landscape is valuable heritage. The sense of place is important and a benefit to all of us. Once lost, it cannot be regained. The Scottish Government's historic environment strategy, our place and time, supports our vision of conservation. The local people support the ongoing restoration of this historic environment. You have 30 seconds and to want go to keep the sense of antiquity which Mark Farm has. I ask that this application be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, questions for Janet? In that case, thank you for your presentation. If you're kind enough to take your seat. I now have uh, Matthew Wakefield. Matthew, if you'd like to come forward. And just when you're ready, Matthew, you have the same three minutes, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go. And if you'd just like to wait in case members have questions for you, that's Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew. I live and own Mark Farm, Twynham. I would just like to say I don't know the applicant personally, neither do I wish any of you will, but I'm strongly against the proposed build. Neither the applicant or the landowner live in the parish, and Twynham Community Council is against this. I was staggered the day after moving into our home to be given an housing application by Carla McWinney. 
I am renovating Mark Farm, which is three foot walls and the traditional way with a slate roof. The, pro the proposed application would damage our, our efforts to restore this ancient building and keep the rural way alive. Our roots are from Twynham. My family's been there for five generations. Great granddad, granddad, dad, everything. My family still live in Twynham and own a farm not too far from the site proposed. The site is not a small building group and fails to meet the council's guidance for its H3 policy. It's an open field used for grazing and silage with horses from the nearby equestrian centre using this ancient drove road, which is hundreds of years old. There's lots of agricultural vehicles. Added traffic danger would be increased. The proposed new build would stick out like a sore thumb. All the buildings are part of my ancient Mark farm and are set in a much-loved landscape. The proposed site is an open field and would change the character of the whole area and reverse the sense of my current restoration. There are lots of houses, in actual fact, in the market. There's just no need whatsoever for this build. I ask for a unanimous objection to this application, which is undermining my work. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. Any members have any questions for Matthew? No, in that case, we'd like to resume your seat and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We now have uh, Chris Dickey, who, who's the applicant. Is Chris present? You have the same three minutes, Chris, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Good morning. I'm uh, Chris Dickey, and the applicant for this application. The application is for a new family home for myself and my family. We are currently outgrowing our existing accommodation and have no facility to extend to meet our needs. We have always lived in the area and want our kids to grow up here too. We don't want to have to leave the area to find suitable alternative accommodation. Our search for suitable dwelling within our budget is not proven fruitful and we have been offered the opportunity of some land to build an affordable family home at the application site which financially would meet our requirements. Housing in the Countryside Policy H3, building within small building groups, was adopted by the Council to encourage small-scale developments of one and two units in rural areas. It's been confirmed by the planning case officer that Mark Farm is to be identified as a small building group as it meets the criteria of the policy more than three dwellings which provide a sense of place. It can be seen on, on the committee map. Can we put that there? There is an existing cluster of dwellings in a localised area. Item 4.6 of the committee report states a small building group should be capable of viewed as a group within its landscape and is seen on the committee map, it obviously is. A detailed research exercise has been carried out in a small building group noted as suitable within the Stuart Tree and Mid Galloway House and Markets on the Council's small building group, listed date November 2018. The committee reports note that in 4.9 that Mark Farmers considered to form a small building group as such, there requires to be a level of consistency. The detailed research shows that a large proportion of the suitable small building groups listed are similar in layout to Mark Farm, which is deemed to meet the criteria. Many of these developments have a recent houses approved, many on the edge of settlements which have no defined naturally established boundaries, and boundaries have only been created as part of the housing developments. These include Ockham Hill, where three houses was erected, land between the existing farm and the cottage at the end of the road, which are over 120 metres apart. This is less than the distance between Mark Farm and Mark Cottage, which is noted at 115 metres. Meikle records several houses approved, many of which are more than 40 metres apart. Burnbray declared brand new houses erected with no former established boundaries. Girthen there was four new houses, single track road not immediately adjacent to the farmhouse. The list goes on, and I do have pictures here if needed for them. The reason for the positioning of the site was to help maintain a level of privacy to the existing dwelling houses. You have 30 seconds to go. We, would, we could have approached the site immediately adjacent to the existing grouping. However, we were in the opinion that this would be negative effect on the neighbouring properties. I personally, therefore, do not consider any development opposed to dwellings between Mark Farm and Mark Corner as a rubber, ribbon development as, rather than an infill site as Mark Corner defines a clear SPG edge or end point for development as it were. I can understand why policy would not want to allow endless development into the countryside, but I don't think you can get much of a clear boundary as can Mark Corner. Can you just Connor. draw your presentation to a conclusion, Sorry. please? 
Just to go on quickly about the roads, the road department, I've seen no issue in it. The We're kind of going quickly, sir. You now be on three oh, minutes. Is that, sorry. But I have uh, if members have questions for you. Any questions for the applicant members? In that case, thank you very much for the presentation. If you just resume your seat again. Members were in session. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. I would like to propose that we get our wellies on and go for a site visit, Chair. Um, there's, four ish, there's four things that I would particularly like to see. Um, there's reference to the septic tank flooding. I would like to see what the situation is with there. Um, they're talking about the materials used and how it doesn't um, fit in with the other buildings in that group. I would like to see what the materials on the other building was because it's not 100% clear on the pictures. I've got, I'm looking at the access by the single track which was raised. Our um, roads officers are fine with that, but there's, a, there's an objection. Well, in the objections as mentioned, I'd like to see the single track. Um, also, our officer said that it's actually difficult to assess the building group because of its informal nature. I'd like to see how this fits in, if it does fit in, and what the committee would think to that. OK, we have a proposal for the site visit. Ian? Thank you, Chair. I'll just come back to some of the comments we made earlier. When you look at that, it looks like a, it was the top left-hand corner of the original guidance. It does look as if it fits, but each case in its own merits, as Carla's already outlined, and I think that's the correct way to look at it. But I'm finding it difficult to put it into context, so I would support a site visit, Chairman, just to get a greater understanding. There has been a number of uh, points raised, which will probably look, look to be researched as well. Some Andrew's touched on, I think, in regards to maybe precedence, maybe the wrong word, but uh, other cases, but I would like to know the timelines. Yeah, we'll this, time. this, this is a request for a site visit, and uh, you've seconded Well, it. I certainly agree with that, and I'll Good. second that, Chairman. Are uh, there any the alternative views? Do we have enough information before us? Are members happy with a site visit? Okay, site visit has been agreed. Lucy? And I can confirm that in relation to item 6, members have agreed to go on a site visit. If members are happy, we'll go into agenda item 7, and after 7, we'll stop for a 30 minute recess for a comfort break. So, we'll go to agenda item number 7 an application for the sighting of four glamping pods and two non residential chalets, formation of parking area, installation of septic tank and soak away and minor road improvements at Glen Mill, the Glen Dumfries. The application types full plan permission. The reference number is 18 stroke 0995 stroke full. And the recommendation is to approve subject conditions in the case officer is Billy Murray. Billy, would you like to take us through your presentation when you're ready, please? Yes, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Chair. This is an application uh, for four uh, small two-person uh, glamping pods, which are uh, effectively rigid tents, to all intents and purposes, made out of timber, and two non-residential chalets. So this is the location plan, the application site shown in red. Uh, it's to the west of Dumfries. Uh, the green line you see running through there is the A75. That's a closer view of the application site uh, adjacent to Glen Mill uh, and close to Cargan Water. It's on the southern side of Cargan Glen. Uh, this is an aerial view again of the application site, uh, just showing the, the wooded nature uh, of the site and its surroundings. <clears throat> this is a closer view of the site. Uh, effectively, the site is in two parts. Uh, that's uh, intersected by a private way running to Glen Mill. Uh, the northern part of the site towards the Cargan Water is where the, the structures would be, the four pods and the two chalets. Uh, the southern part of the site would be where the car parking area was provided. Uh, the two small red areas at the side of the public road uh, to the right and downwards are the two pieces of land where two new parking, not parking, sorry, passing places would be provided, passing laybys uh, as part of proposed road improvements. Uh, so this is the approach to the site. 
Uh, in front of you there is the private way that runs through the site. So I'm standing on the public road. Uh, the private way branches off there. There will be development on both sides of the track. On the right is the wooded area where the, the, the development would be in terms of the pods and chalets. Uh, and clearer. What's this hair trigger again? Clearer in this one. Uh, that's further down the private way with the wooded area to the right uh, on the side of the glen where the pods and chalets would be and the area on the left where the car parking would be. So this is the area where the parking would be. Uh, as originally proposed, uh, the works here were going to incorporate um, six end-on parking spaces, which would have involved quite a bit of earthworks and formation of a bund. Uh, on officer's advice, that was amended such that the parking will now effectively be uh, an extended roadside or trackside lay-by, which you'll see from the drawings later in the presentation. Um, as always with these wooded sites, it's difficult to show you specific sites, so the next few slides are just to give you an impression of, of, of the woodland nature of the sites within which the, the pods and chalets will be located and also to try and give you an, an indication of the difference in levels between the developable area of the site and the river levels because flooding was an issue as you'll have seen from the report. So this is just a number of slides within the woodland where the pods and chalets would be located. You can see in that one that the, the, the river level is on the right slopes up quite steeply from the river level. Um, the actual development would be at the higher level towards the left in that view, so it would be well above uh, the river level. That's another one just showing the river uh, and the steep nature of the site on the left where it rises in that view almost vertically from river level up towards the developable area of the site. That's if you're looking from the developable area level down towards the river. This is again just within the woodland where the pods and chalets would be located. Again within the woodland. And a further one within the woodland showing the river level uh, below the developable area of the site. As you'll have noted from the report, there are a number of representations about road safety uh, and there was considered to be an issue by uh, our colleagues in the Roads Authority who, who provided consultation advice on that aspect of the development. The applicant had in fact taken pre-application advice from roads in terms of what would be uh, best in terms of mitigation uh, and that's that has resulted in the provision of the two passing laybys. So this is a view at the junction with the U231, which goes to the site, and the U347. Now, the U347 is what used to be the A75. So this is the branch off the A75. It's quite steep. You would approach um, from the right in that view. So that's coming from Dumfries' direction, and you would turn right into the U231, it's quite a tight bend and it slopes down steeply. Immediately you turn off. This is a view looking back up towards that junction. Um, the proposed, one of the proposed passing places, laybys, would be on the right in that view, approximately between the, the yellow bin that you see there and the junction. This is looking down the hill from the junction or just past the junction. Uh, you'll note in that view, as things stand at the moment, there are steep embankments on both sides of a narrow road, so there are no real passing opportunities. There's no verges, there's no informal passing opportunities. Uh, thus the proposal to provide the two passing laybys. This is further down the hill. Uh, again, note the embankments that, that, that restrict the width of the road and give no passing or meeting opportunities. The second of the proposed laybys, passing places, would be on the left in that view. 
uh, just towards the apex of that bend. And this is just round that corner. Uh, in that view, the private way you saw in the first slide that leads to the site branches off to the left. The U231 continues round to the right. And that's from the same point looking back up. Um, the, the second of the proposed passing laybys, as I indicated earlier, would be on the right in that view, just past the, the apex of that bend that you see there. So these are the drawings submitted with the application. Uh, that's the application site and other area, other land in the applicant's control shown in blue. That's a closer view. That's the block plan. Uh, this is a view of the proposed glamping cocoons. Uh, they're quite simple. As I said earlier, they're, to all intents and purposes, they're rigid timber tents. Um, intended for occupation by two people. Uh, they're constructed of natural timber logs with timber shingle roofs and timber windows and doors. Uh, this is the proposed chalets, two of which were, are, <coughs> excuse me, are incorporated as part of the development. Uh, as you will have noted from uh, the report, officers had some reservations or have some reservations about the designs of these as compared to the designs of the pods. However, on balance uh, and based on a response from the applicant on that point, uh, we consider that uh, they are acceptable as part of the development. Um, this is the topographical survey that was submitted. It's pretty meaningless in a slide. Um, this is the proposed layout. Um, the four darker Smaller units are the four pods uh, and the two slightly lighter square units are the two chalets. Uh, just to be clear, the two at the extreme right in that view are simply the key uh, to the, uh, the drawing. Uh, there was some confusion at the outset from third parties looking at drawings and thinking that in actual fact these two on the right were part of the development. Just to be absolutely clear, it is four pods and two chalets. The two on the right are not part of the development. And that's just another view of the layout. This is the proposed road improvement showing the, the two uh, passing laybys. The one bottom left is the one just at the junction. Uh, the one top right is the one, as I mentioned, just before the apex of that bend. Um, Bottom right hand corner in that view is just a, a closer detail of the, the lay-by at the junction. So the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Thanks, Billy. Questions for the case officer members? Ian? Just a small one. Uh, it was one that was asked earlier, Billy, but... Went to John Coffey's lungs up. Just in regards to, is there any land ownership uh, potential issues when it comes to the passing places. It looks for the slide previously, you showed us we blew it, there was ownership there. Just a due, due uh, diligence question, really, Billy, that's all. No, all of the application site, including the two passing laybys, are within the applicant's land holding. Thanks, Ian. John Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. I see the pods are serviced, but the, are, the two chalets are unserviced. Is that not a bit strange? Billy? No, I think it's uh, made clear in the, in the report that the two chalets are proposed for communal use um, by occupants of the pods, so uh, and they're not to be occupied overnight in any way, so there's no need for any servicing within these chalets, uh, so that's quite acceptable, and I don't think that's unusual at all. Thanks, John. Other members? No other questions for case officer? Okay. We go to representations. Now, we have two written representations that we have agreed to have Lucy read out. Lucy will read them out in the manner that they were received, so the, the first one received will be read first, and that way there will be a degree of fairness. So just read them both, Lucy, please, and then we'll go to the representative, which is the applicant. And I'll give you three minutes, Lucy.
The first objector is Dr. Ronald Strachan. And he is submitted as follows. I would like the committee to note that essentially I do maintain my grounds of objection as reflected in my letter of 8th August. In relation to those objections, one, I am glad it is clarified that only four residential units are applied for. I am concerned, however, that this will be just be at the start. If approved, it will be used as a precedent by other landowners and such developments will proliferate. If this development succeeds, I am sure it will be extended and the two amenity units are surely put in preparatory to an application for change of use to residential units. It makes no commercial sense otherwise. The accessible areas of the Galloway Coast have now virtually disappeared by the extension to vast caravan and chalet sites of developments that started very small scale indeed. You can see this happening very nearby at Nunland. If approved, I trust the planning authority will be very mindful of creep in an area more suited to residential use. Two, I remain of the view that such developments are not suitable for a quiet scenic area such as this, where if there are developments, they should be consistent with high quality and the high amenity housing in particular to encourage highly qualified staff to come to the hospital. Three, the road configurations here are unsafe for such a large increase in traffic. I said 100% increase before, but actually, since clearly traffic is intended to be routed over the slip road from Green Top, improved by an extra lay-by, the increase will be 300%, since only two immediate properties use the road presently, whereas there will be six properties using it for the development as envisaged, which increase will result in loss of privacy and represent overdevelopment. Since construction traffic would be just as dangerous on the unimproved road as the increased traffic caused by holiday guests. I strongly request that if approved, the condition in relation to roads should be on the basis that no development shall be commenced till the passing places are in place. The requirement for lay-by construct should not be delayed till completion of the development. <coughs> Four, in relation to the condition in relation to lighting, rather than just leave it to what might be agreed between the planning officials and the applicant, the committee should give stronger guidance and the conditions should specifically state that any lighting should not be visible off-site, so must be mounted low level and be down lighters to limit any spread of light. I do commend my views to the committee. Yours faithfully, Dr Ronald Strachan. You do only nine seconds to go, Lucy. And the second one, please. And the second one is from a John Niven. Dear Mr Murray, thank you for your correspondence regarding the above application. I will not, however, be able to attend the meeting on Thursday. As per my original comment on 5th August, I feel that the real issue is access to the pods along a very narrow access road. At a very little cost, this could be largely resolved by the installation of two passing places in the vicinity of Cargan Glen Trout Farm. I hope this can be conveyed to the councillors present. Thank you, John Niven. Thanks, Lucy. Okay, we now have uh, our registered speaker, the applicant, Mark Franklin. Mark, would you like to come forward, please? And you will have the same three minutes. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go, just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And if you'd be kind enough to wait afterwards just in case members have questions for you. Just whenever you're ready, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think it's a great frustration to any of us who live in Dumfries and Galloway when we repeat, read reports of basically the Lake District and Highlands being full to the point of bursting every summer, uh, and yet you can drive from Dumfries to Stranra and back roads on a sunny day in August and, and not see too many cars at all. Understandably, the council has identified tourism as one of the best opportunities we have to boost the local economy and speaking from someone who manages the largest food bank in the region, the local economy certainly needs to be boosted and we're pleased that in a very, very small way our proposed development I think can help with that. Um, responding to some of the objections, we have no plans whatsoever to turn our original plans into some vast sprawling development. We, we, there are no plans whatsoever for that. 
We have no plans to use any arc light style lighting, uh, the last thing we'd want. Um, any lighting will indeed be very discreet and no threat whatsoever to the dark sky. Um, we are more than aware that there's a steep bank down to the river and we'll certainly put a safety fence in to, put, to make sure kids in particular are safe. Um, the nearest property to the development is ours and so if there is any noise, which was um, mentioned in other objections, then we will certainly make sure that noise stops for our own point of view as much as, as anyone else's. Obviously the, main, the, the, the most numerous objections are to do with increased traffic. Um, it'll be very, very rare that we have any more than two cars uh, visiting the site. And assuming they come and go twice a day each, that will be about four additional car journeys a day um, on average through, through the, the times when, when the site is being used. I, I don't think that's doubling the local traffic. I think it's probably near between 10 and 20%. There has been a very steep increase in, in traffic up and down the steep hill over recent years, and that is because many of the people who live up the Glen, including us, uh, like to order stuff on the internet. And that means on a very regular basis, I'd say four times a day, we have large vehicles, either transits, double wheelbase transits, super, supermarket delivery vans, or even 10 tonners going up and down the track. And that can indeed be quite difficult. So I suggest rather than making a problem in terms of traffic for, for, the, for our local area. I think our passing places, once they're up and running, will, will in fact make things a great deal better in terms of large vehicles coming up and down that hill to, to make local deliveries. You have 30 seconds to go, Mark. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased that uh, the planning officers have recommended this for, for, for approval, and, and I hope that we'll be able to share the beautiful place where we live with, with visitors in the years to come. Thanks, Mark. Do any members have any questions for Mark in relation to his proposal? Andrew? Thanks, Jeff. Mark, would it be right in assuming that the nature of these pods is that you won't really attract much traffic, but more cyclists and walkers? Um, it's kind of hard to predict. I, I would expect with the growth in, in visitors coming to the region for mountain biking that we will see our share of cyclists. Um, whether they come on a train and bring the bike with them, we, I can't really predict until we're up and running. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, Elaine? Uh, one of the objectors, uh, of the objections was, uh, and it's on page 108, a threat to dark sky status from any proposed external lighting. Now, I don't think the area is actually in the dark sky area of uh, Dumfries and Galloway, so therefore... I presume you're not planning any form of lighting that would be so uh, vivid that it would actually affect the dark sky area. No, no, uh, most definitely not. That any outdoor lighting will be low LED solar powered lighting, which will be entirely invisible from from anywhere, really. And the condition eight tries to deal with that, Elaine. Uh, Ian, I just want to note that one of the objections being raised is running about the. The methodology of construction, I think, in particular, and it's, it spoke about the uh, the passing places. I just wondered, have you got any idea what your method, if it was to be granted your permission, what would the methodology be? And they were specifically asking, saying because of traffic generation, would you construct the passing ways first? Uh, yeah, we, we most certainly would, um, because the contractor who would be constructing the passing lanes will also be involved in creating the parking places and the basis for the pods. So yes, the pa the, the, the passing laybys would be completed before um, before any any uh, any delivery traffic arrived. And that's condition ten T. Hey Jeff, are there any other questions for the applicant, John Young? Hello, oh, Mark. Could you outline how the shallows will be used? Yeah, it's. I mean, the pods are essentially bedrooms. Um, you know, they'll have two beds and a small bathroom in the pod. The chalets will be for visitors to use during the day, so they'll just basically have sitting furniture, a settee, armchairs, probably a TV. Um, but they will be they won't be used under any circumstances for anybody to sleep in. They're, they're basically for for daytime use. Thanks, John. Any other questions, Pauline? Um. Councillor Dempster, looking at the plans um, all for increased tourism in the area, 
there, there has been a bit of negativity up in the Highlands and other parts of Scotland with these kind of developments. I don't think this one, but could I just ask um, um, Mr. Franklin, would he have plans for the future for, dare I say, hot tubs, which seems to be a big issue with noise in the future? Thank you. Uh, we have absolutely no plans for, for, for hot tubs. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, thanks very much for your presentation, Mark. Just resume your seat, please. Members were in session. Art Chair. Agree the recommendations, Chair. Agreed. Agreed. Any alternative proposals? And in that case, confirm the decision of the committee, please, Lucy. And I can confirm that in relation to item 7, the committee have agreed the recommendations as per the report, which is to approve the application subject to conditions. Thank you. Apologies to folks who are still waiting for the uh, application to be determined. We're going to have a 30-minute comfort break. We'll return at 1.15. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, members. We'll now continue the, the meeting with agenda item number 8, a planning application for the erection of detached domestic garage and workshop tractor shed for domestic use. The application types full application. The reference number is 18 stroke 1775 stroke full. The recommendations to refuse. And the case officer, Jessica Taylor. <laughs> hey, Jessica, you take us through your slides, please. Thank you. Um, so, this application site is at Nursery Cottage, which is just on the edge of Dalbeatty. Um, members may recall uh, an almost identical application was determined by the committee back in October 2018, which was refused. The application comprises of got Billy's trick. <laughs> comprises of the construction of a proposed domestic garage and tractor shed. So this uh, plan shows the uh, elevations and floor plan of the proposed garage. and the proposed elevations and floor plans for the tractor shed. Um, just run through some photographs of the site, so the location of the proposed uh, garage. And again, from a different angle. And this is the view of where the proposed tractor shed is going to be. And again, another view. And this is the view of the site from the public road. And a further view. As with the earlier application in October 2018, the concerns with this application relate to flooding. Both SEPA and the Council's flood risk management team maintain their objections to the proposed development as per the previous application that was for the same development at the application site as it is within the medium likelihood floodplain and may place buildings and persons at flood risk, contrary to SPP. As no further information has been provided by the applicant which allows SEPA or the flood risk team to withdraw their objection, the application is recommended for refusal as, as set out in the report. Thank you, Jessica. Any questions for the case officer? If there are no questions for the case officer, pardon? Councillor McKee. Councillor McKee. And no be specifics, I don't think, but the man's maybe a collector or, 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 or has the old tractors because there's quite a, a, a movement now among folk to have, well, like classic vehicles, classic tractors, but I don't know and I don't know whether Jessica can help or not. You just have to presume it's a standard uh, type tractor. Thanks, Joe. Any other questions? Okay, we come to the representations. The first we have is a... Ian Robertson on behalf of Dalbeatty Community Council, who are a statutory consultee and objecting to the application. So, Ian, if you'd like to come forward, please. You will have uh, three minutes to make your representation. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And if you'd like to wait in case members have questions for you, that'd be great. Thank you. And just whenever you're ready, Ian. Good afternoon. The uh, Dalbeatty Community Council maintains their objections to this development from when it was first raised as application 180891 full 
on the 14th of January 2018. We are of the view that this development is not appro appropriate for a domestic situation because of the size and appearance of both of the buildings, the garage and the tractor shed. The size and appearance of particularly the tractor shed is more suitable for an industrial situation rather than a domestic one. Also, the area is zoned in local development plan for housing and given this zoning, this development is inappropriate. We also believe the size of the buildings in this development would have a detrimental impact on the appearance and visual amenity of this entry to Dalbite. Our view on this has not changed since the last time the committee cons considered and refused this application. The area, sorry, I say again, our view is that nothing has changed since the last time this, the, this committee considered and refused this, this development. The area in question is still a floodplain. Scottish Environmental Protection Agency's objections are still the same as before. The flood risk management team's objections are still as before. Scottish planning policy has not changed and the planner's recommendation of refusal has not changed. We therefore believe that the decision from this committee today should be again to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Any questions for... The objector. In that case, if you'd like to resume your seat, sir, thank you very much for your presentation. We now have Margaret Watson, who is a, a supporter. If you'd like to come forward, please, Margaret. You will have the same three minutes. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go, just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And if you'd be kind enough to wait in case there are any questions, that'd be fine. Good afternoon, everybody. My comments in support of this application, along with those of others, are summarised in section 3.1 of the case officer's report. I therefore don't propose to reiterate those, but will add further comment in explanation. The case officer clearly states in sections 4.4 and 4.5 that she has no objection to the size, design, height or location of either the garage or the tractor shed. They are both appropriate in scale and the colour and materials to be used make them aesthetically, aesthetically acceptable. Section 4.8 goes on to state, however, that whilst the proposed structures are not unacceptable or unsuitable for their location, the issue, issue of flood risk is of significant concern. It goes on to state that the proposal does not comply with either Scottish planning policy or IN7 of the Local Development Plan on Flooding, and therefore, as a result of policy, is being recommended for, for refusal. However, there is very recent documentary evidence of planning approval having been granted to applications situated within identified areas of flood risk, one being an almost identical double garage development located less than half a mile from the site of this one. That application was not referred to SEPA for comment, nor was it referred to this committee. It was simply approved. Whilst planners initially advised that the double garage at Waterside House should be restricted in height and build un built under permitted development regulations, after a councillor intervened, common sense prevailed and planning permission was granted for the higher structure proposed. I would therefore suggest that to, review, to refuse this virtually identical proposal would be nonsensical and demonstrate blatant inconsistency in approach by Dumfries and Ganaway Planning Department. Can I also remind this committee that a considerably larger proposal by Annan Distillery in August of just last year, despite being located within an area of flood risk, was also granted approval. As was the case in the Annan Distillery application, this proposal also incorporates flood resilient design and as a result reduces the displacement of any flood water to an absolute minimum. To put some context on the perceived risk of flooding, the culvert under the railway embankment at Nursery Cottage was in place for 160 years, and the Council's flood risk management team confirmed that the Council has no historical records of flooding in this location. You have 30 seconds to go. Can I therefore respectfully suggest that as members of the planning committee, you draw on your extensive local knowledge, experience, as you've already done so in previously stated examples, to make pragmatic, informed decisions and you take a similarly equitable approach in this instance. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any questions for Margaret? Pauline? Uh, Councillor Dempster, could I please ask um, Claire Kirk if this is um, a suitable question? Will you actually see the, the tractor shed from the road at all, or just the top of it? Thank you. Jessica? It's, it's, it's for the, uh, uh, the, the speaker. You can do that Sorry. at the end. I can answer if you yeah. want. Do you want the lady to answer? I would, please, thank you. Yeah, go on then, please. Uh, it's very unlikely that you would see it from the road, so it's so far back from the road that if you were to see anything, it would only be the roof in a small part, part of. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pauline. Any other questions? In that case, we'd like to resume your seat. Thank you very much for the presentation. Last, last speaker is Charles Fulton. Charles Fulton, who is the applicant. And again, Charles, you'll have three minutes, and I'll remind you of 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the grounds made by the case officer in the report for recommending my application should be refused by this committee is a misrepresentation of the facts. Please ask me to justify that statement during questions. SEPA have said that the removal of the railway embankment and culvert would be beneficial in terms of reducing the level of risk to both Nursery Cottage and John Street and will reduce flood risk overall in Dolbiti. They've also said, irrespective of the potential benefits that have been provided, we are unable to support proposals for new buildings within the floodplain. That's the bottom line. SEPA and the Council's flood risk management team will not contradict Scottish planning policy. However, planners and this planning committee can and have made appropriate exceptions to that dictate. SEPA have also said, whilst we acknowledge that the removal of the embankment will provide a greater flood storage area, the potential benefits have not been quantified. Let me demonstrate and quantify to the committee the benefits I have already delivered whilst rehabilitating my property. First slide, please. Um, <clears throat> the former culvert is at the top of the screen. The shaded area and arrows show where floodwaters would have flowed before I removed the culvert. Through my property, down John Street, through houses in Queen's Grove, Glen Early Terrace and Bar Hill Crescent, and through Munch's Park Care Home, heading back to the burn. 39 houses and probably 100 plus souls who would have been impacted by such an event. Because I've removed this culvert, the likelihood of this happening is reduced enormously. Next slide. How things looked when the culvert was in place. Next slide. How things look now. The bottleneck is gone, water flow is unimpeded, and there's now a large floodable area with the embankment removed. Next slide. The new yard is lower than nursery cottage to safeguard my house should a flood ever occur. Consider the following figures. The footprint of my buildings, whether 4 metres or 5.5 metres high, will be 178 square metres. The area of the new floodplain is 1,400 square metres. The volume of water displaced by both buildings, were they to flood to say 300 millimetres, would be just 0.8 of a cubic metre. You have 30 seconds to go. The storage capacity for floodwaters I've created is 420 cubic metres over 500 times more than my buildings might potentially displace. The, the report presented to committee throws absolutely no light on these facts. I'd like members to recognise that the work I'm undertaking and propose to finish before I retire represents a demonstrable reduction in the flood risk to buildings and persons and will actually facilitate the conveyance of flood waters contrary to the comments made by SEPA. Can you just try a presentation? I ask members, please. please, to approve my application as it stands so that I might enjoy the full functionality of both proposed buildings at their design heights and locations. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions for the applicant? Ian and then Elaine. I don't mean to be controversial, but with a specific point was made right at the beginning of, this, of, the, of the presentation. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that, please. You'd ask, would we ask you to ask a particular question? Well, thank you for doing so. Um, the wording in the report um, was the same as the first report that came to the committee. Um, and uh, essentially what it said was that um, due to a lack of information, 
um, the ground, you know, that was part of the reason it was being uh, re recommended for refusal. Lack of information that SIPA asked for. Now, what SIPA asked for were two specific questions. They wanted to know, firstly, having removed the embankment, was that now a floodplain? They got an answer to that. They got a topographical survey that illustrated that. And they acknowledged that that was, yes, a new floodplain. The other thing they wanted to know was, would I modify my application to comply with Scottish planning policy? Now, that's SIPA speak for, will you take the buildings away? Because that's the only way that it could comply with Scottish planning policy as far as SIPA is concerned. And I said, well, no, sorry, I'm not going to do that. So um, to say that but both those questions were answered and for it to have been couched as an inappropriate or insufficient um, uh, amount of information submitted in the application is quite misleading. Can we just stop you? We want a specific question answered, no another presentation, because there's a limit to this. Do you have a question? I mean, he's answered the question that I asked, which was with the misleading statements within the... He's addressed that as far as I'm concerned. Chairman. That's fine. Thank you. Elaine? Uh, I suspect my uh, question has probably been partially answered, but I wondered, we would consider the planning applications committee considered this only four months ago, and I just wondered what's the difference between this planning application and the one that the committee uh, considered in October? Is it the information from SEPA, or is there, have there been any other, other changes to the planning application since? Well, um, there's, uh, okay, I think that the main thing is that I failed miserably in my three minutes last time. Uh, to get over the information about the, the very beneficial impact I, my work in removing the culvert, specifically, and uh, the, the railway embankment has had. And I think there's a, there's, there has to be scope for mitigating circumstances to be brought into place here um, to uh, consider that perhaps m the overall impact of my application is very beneficial. I mean, the only reason for, for refusal is that I'm proposing a development on a floodplain. The fact is that floodplain didn't exist until I created it at quite significant expense. And, you know, I have improved the flood situation in Dalbiti. Uh, it's as simple as that. The other bit of information I didn't have, I was asked last time by yourself, um, could I achieve my objectives under permitted development? Now, I gave you an honest but an uninformed answer at that time. I've since realised, speaking to my architect, that a mono-pitch roof of a shed, which has to be a minimum of six degrees, uh, by the time you start at four metres with that pitch, um, by the time uh, you're halfway into the shed, the, the roof timbers will, the roof uh, materials will have encroached under three metres, which is the height of my tractor which isn't a toy, it's a standard tractor um, which I use for processing firewood which I burn to heat my house and also um, to provide firewood for a friend. Um, <clears throat> that's the reason I have the tractor incidentally, it's not a hobby, um, it's a very necessary part of my life um, and there's plenty scope on my property to accommodate it under shelter as I would like to in a properly built shed which is very much more an agricultural style and properly uh, design shed than anything industrial. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, I thank you very much for your presentation. If you'd like to resume your seat, members were in session. Ian? That was started off. I mean, I think the case has been put really well, Jessica, so I think that we need to understand, certainly I need to understand as a member of this committee, what I've heard is that actually since the last application, it's been relayed to us today that there has been mitigation put in place and presented to the council, SEPA, I think, to say that actually this, this has addressed the previous concerns, but clearly within the report it's not been addressed. I'd just like to understand what yourself as a case officer, what the, the points have been made, because there's almost a, a reference to a maladministration as well, from Ken, as, as, as what we've heard, inconsistent approach when I say that. So. I just I think you need a chance to hear what you are, you're thinking was when you put this report together, I think, Jessica. Jessica's delivering the report on behalf of Claire Kirk, who's unable to attend today, but I'm sure she'll do her best to reply. And when you finish replying to Ian, Pauline did ask a question earlier, so I'll get Pauline to ask <coughs> you that again next about sight on this from the roadway. Yeah, I think what we hear, the, based on the information that was submitted with the application, SEPA considered there wasn't sufficient information 
to support the application. It's our view from taking that on board that there isn't sufficient information as a planning authority to make a determination to support this application. So I don't think sufficient has been submitted to change our view from last time the application was submitted. Thanks again. Pauline? Um, Jessica, sorry, um, I do use that road quite frequently. It's the, I think it's, you know, I pass by quite a lot of tourists as well to the area. Could you confirm as well what people would see from the road, please? Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with what was said before. You will be able to view it, but very intermittently, depending on, on, on what you're viewing it for. But it, it, yeah, so because of what's there already, it'll be just glimpses of it and the roof. And just the roof as such. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Any other questions? Ian? If anybody else has come in, I think we've got to... For, for me, with the piece that's missing is actually uh, CEPA's, how, how they've come to their conclusions in regards to the information they've submitted to the Council. If there's been further work undertaken, that, on the face of it, it looks like it's created a floodplain and mit, 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 mitigated sorry, any, uh, against any flood risk in that area. I mean, it's only one small point that's actually... Uh, it's up for the few, I say small point, it's, was it's material, uh, but it's, it's, so we've got one argument saying last, actually there's been a lot of work being undertaken and we've mitigated the purpose, but CEPA hasn't recognised that. I think we should really get to a point of, it'd be easy just to say, okay, if CEPA's objected, flooding, as you naturally would say, listen, you can't build in a floodplain, it has to be refused, but there's ambiguity, I, I feel, and it was over actually what's being said there because of what's been presented today and what CEPA is saying, and, and quite often we've had, it's difficult to, to, to get, uh, I'll say detailed responses at times from super. That's been my experience in the past. So I'm 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 in the mind that we, we get a, a either super here to talk to us in regards to this, rather than just go straight forward. So we've got to and refuse it because I think that's the only option here to take on further information, which I would think is the right thing to do to understand exactly where super is coming from, and maybe the flood risk management team as well. Jim and I would propose that if that's a possibility. I would say no, but I'll ask David, we can't invite SEEP along here to talk to us, that's not how we function. We have a proposal before you and you've asked a recommendation, but David? Well, SEEP have given a detailed response to this consultation and they are maintaining their objection. To a large degree, I mean, as you've heard Jessica just say, that we are not unduly concerned about the, the design materials or siting of the buildings. Effectively, it is almost an issue between the applicant and SEPA which is one of the reasons why I felt it was important to bring it back to the committee, because it actually would give them a right to go to the Scottish ministers, where that could then be decided by an independent reporter. Because with well, the best will in the world, I don't think anybody in this room is a fully qualified hydrologist and understands all the issues, either for or against the development. So if it is refused, the applicant would have a right of appeal to the Scottish ministers, where he could actually get into that level of detail with his concerns about what SEPA have or haven't said. But we have got a definitive response from it. SEPA are not going to give us anything else, I would suspect. Yeah. Uh, just a small question in regards to the process, because I think if, if, if the Council was to approve it, so I'm speaking hypothetically, uh, there's a particular process would have to be followed as well, I think, in regard to ministers, just to get that clarified. David? That's correct. If, um, you know, there was, if you remember this morning, we were talking about the, the Glenn Muckluck scheme. Now, I mentioned at that time that we didn't need to consult the Scottish ministers because Prestwick Airport isn't actually a, a key agency. SEPA, however, are a key agency, so it's not within the gift of the committee to just actually approve it today. It would be a, a willingness to approve, if you're so minded. That has to be referred up to the Scottish ministers, and they will decide whether or not they're going to call it in or not. Actually. <coughs> Just, just listening to what members are saying uh, and, and, and the response for David there, I think probably the safest way that we can do this and, and obviously get SEPA to a, a table of some sort to actually go with the recommendations, and I would propose that we actually do that, Chair. I'll David. second that, Chair. So we have a proposal to refuse by Arch Driver, seconded by John Martin. Anyone otherwise minded? Andy? Uh, um, I'm slow, sorry for being a bit slow coming in here, but I'm looking at 2.4 in the SEPA part here. They seem to be saying that their recommendations are based on things in August 2012, which is when it's, um, which confirmed that the nursery cottage was prone to flooding. But that was all altered when, because I remember the original application when the, when the bank was taken away, the old railway thing was taken away. Um, and if so, that, that's no clear to me what actually SEPA are meaning. 
David, uh, Chair, Chair, if you read on down to the fourth paragraph, it goes on about the topographical survey which was provided for the previous application in 2018. So they, they clearly are aware of the current situation. So we have a motion to refuse that seconded. If there are no alternative views, that's the decision of the committee. Okay, can you just confirm what the decision of the committee is, please, Lucy? And I can confirm that in relation to item 8, members have agreed to go with the recommendations as per the report, and that is to refuse the application. Thank you. We, thanks, Jessica. We come to agenda item number 9. The erection of a, an application for the erection of a detached garage workshop, which is retrospective, at Dairy Cottage, Drumcreef, Moffat. This is a full application, reference number 18 stroke, 1802 stroke full. The recommendation is to approve some conditions, and the case officer is Beth Halliday. Beth, hi, will you just take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. This is a retrospective application for the erection of a garage workshop building at Dairy Cottage, Dumcreef, near Moffat. The reason it is before you today is, is, it, is because it has been called in by an elected member for the reasons set out in point 1.1 of the report. I'll just go through the plans. <clears throat> so the site is sited approximately a mile and a half to the south east of the town of Moffat. And Drumcreef, Dumcreef, I should say, um, house and cottages, associated cottages are shown on the block plan. The application site is known as Dairy Cottage. The reason I have put in this slide is because in the 2015 application, um, part of that application was for a carport, and that's the elevations and floor plan of the consented carport, which is slightly smaller than the one that's before you today. This is the one that's before you today, this proposed elevations and floor plan um, showing the, 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 the as-built building. So just going through the pictures, uh, this is the, the C99A road coming out of Moffat going towards Womfrey, and this is approaching the, the lodge, which is the entrance up to the Dumcreef House and the associated um, cottages. And this is just showing you that the access drive, it's, it's, a, it's a winding access drive with trees on either side, obviously, uh, going up to the, the properties. This is where the road uh, forks off. So going down to the right would take you to Dumcreef House itself. And the road to the left is to the application site can just kind of see the red roof just within the, the Y in the, in the left-hand side, which is part of Dairy Cottage. And again, just approaching Dairy Cottage, you're just getting a view of part of Dairy Cottage and actually the Dumcreef Cottages, the courtyard cottages to the, to the rear of that. And again, just getting up to the site, just to show you that you can now see the, the proposal that's in front of you today, just on the left-hand side of the picture. And this is just approaching the building um, with Dairy Cottage Red Roof on the right-hand side. Just another view of the actual uh, garage workshop building. And then now looking towards the southeast, just to show you the garage workshop building with the, the balcony feature. And you can just see the Dairy Cottage on the left-hand side. And this is just a view to give you a context of the site with the Dairy Cottage and then the Dumcreef Cottages to the rear of that. And again, another elevation, just that the elevation that actually faces on to the host dwelling. Uh, again, another view just showing the both in context together with the, the cottage and the garage workshop building. And this is to show the caravan, uh, which is part of the part of the yard site. This was taken from the C99A road, uh, just coming down before you got to the lodge, obviously, where you can you can see and better in the, the next one where I've zoomed in. So it's so just giving you an idea. You can obviously see the the garage. Then you can see 
dairy cottage and then see the, the, the cottages, the, the courtyard cottages to the left, just showing you the differences in heights between the buildings uh, and how they sit together in the landscape. This slide uh, was given to us by the objector showing the, the um, height of the garage in relation to Dairy Cottage. Um, in this, it's showing an approximate height of just over a metre, a metre in height, 105.2. This is taken from a different perspective from the applicant. Uh, again, just where they're standing in the site is showing that with a different perspective, the, the heights look, look quite similar. Uh, the application is recommended for approval conditionally. Thank you, Beth. Any questions for the case officer, Dougie? Thanks, Chair. Um, Beth, could you possibly take us back to a photograph showing the, the balcony? That's, that's fine, thanks. Mm -hmm. I can understand um, that certainly the proportion of the building and the, including the balcony gives the impression that it could be intended as uh, a dwelling uh, to live in. Can, can you give us what you're understanding of the purpose of the balcony is, why why that balcony is there, and how it relates to the intended use of the applicant for the, the building? Right. My understanding, just because I've been out in sight, obviously, is that it seemed to be the way to get in from that banking, the, the side banking. Uh, there is a door, obviously, down in the accessing the, the ground floor, and there's also an internal staircase, but it seemed to be a way of access into the top part. Any other questions for case officer, Elaine? Nevertheless, I mean, uh, leading on from what Councillor Campbell was saying, it does seem slightly unusual for a, for a garage to have an upper floor and a skylight and a balcony. I mean, that is, most garages don't have those sorts of features. I, you know, I, I can completely understand why some of the objectors might wonder about the true purpose of this. Yes, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. And um, as I say, my, my understanding is it's just a way of access. Um, um, yeah. Jim McCoy. Thanks, Chair. Just <laughs> sticking with this slide, does the workshop or garage have a flue which would suggest there is internal heating? I would say it's a log burning stove, but okay, there? Yeah, yes, there's, there's a log burning stove within the, within the garage, yes. Uh, Ronnie? Yeah, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong here, actually. I mean, I'm looking at this. The building measures 7.5 metres in length and 6.17 metres in width. Is that correct? For what, sorry? For this, the floor plan. Sorry, bit, the floor the, the plan, yes, yes. So, I mean, for the life of me, I mean, how would you put a dwelling into that size? I will not have another dwell in mind that this yeah. is an application for a domestic garage and members are just concerned about some of the additional aspects of it. But it's still for a garage, David. It's maybe just to, to clarify that um, the obviously the applicant is in the process of um, doing up Dairy Cottage at the moment. He, I understand, is a joiner and that's why mm. he's got the particular requirements for what he's looking for. But I notice um, Mr. Lightfoot, the applicant, is one of the speakers, so I'm sure you can ask many questions of him as to how and why he needs it the way it is. Okay, so still on questions for the case officer? No more? Okay, then we have two registered speakers. The first is an objector, Mr. or Dimitri Pantaloris. Miss, sorry. Hey, apologies for that. You will have three minutes, and uh, I will remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion, and just whenever you're ready. And if you'd remain seated, please, members might want to ask you questions at the end of your presentation. Firstly, um, we've never received neighbour notification for any applications on Dumcreef Estate. We own the land surrounding all these properties, and we've never had one notification from planning 
That's the first point I have to make. This, this is a building um, that has been obviously put into the courtyard, well, at the outside of the courtyard buildings. They're saying that uh, this is meant to be a subservient building. It's not, this is not in keeping with the stone buildings that are within the courtyard or the dairy cottage. And it's not in keeping with Dumcreef House, which is only 75 metres from this building. We have been refused on a number of occasions to erect any kind of building on our land. So many times we've applied for the under tourism, under food and tourism, and we've never been approved for anything, not even a garage. How is this person allowed to do this? He's moved his septic tank from its original planned position that he received planning consent, we received planning consent before we sold it to him, and he's moved it to erect this garage. He didn't receive planning permission to move it. He's also put the pipe deep into our field without our permission. He's damaged field drains, and the ground is permanently soaking. The, the farmer, our tenant farmer, has complained on numerous occasions about the, the area of land that he's damaged. But this man and several other people on the estate have done things out with our knowledge and without planning consent. In fact, somebody has actually gained planning consent for a log cabin in the woods. The drive is ours. We maintain it. They've been using the drive as a, a freeway, speeding up and down. They take the, the heavy machines up and down. They don't contribute to any of their repairs. In fact, they continue to make more damage. We've not had the chance to object to any of the others other than this one because we found out by chance that this was happening. We've never interfered with anything they've done. All we wanted was to have fair, a fair application. We've always applied in, in a proper manner. We've never built anything that we shouldn't have built. You have 30 seconds to go. First, I mean, as you see, the, it's clearly visible from the, the Carlisle Road. It's clearly visible that they're living in it. They have shower facilities. They have everything. What's to say they won't use that as a holiday lodge? That's asking. all I have to say. I mean, it's, it's contrary to local development plan and the proposed development plan. I, I, I just feel it's so unjust and so unfair that we've not been notified about any of these. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. Unfortunately, members will be confined. They might want to ask you a question, but they'll be confined to planning matters because things like fields and uh, maintenance of roadways are out with the scope of this application I today. I understand that. That's so fine. we have members. Do any members have any questions for the objector? <coughs> uh, Andy. Um, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Can you just confirm that you're saying that you've had no notification? We've had no notification whatsoever. Our land surrounds that property. Most properties on the estate, a minimum of two sides, and all the others, three or four sides. We've had no notification. When I complained to planning, they said we shouldn't be notified because we're not on the plan. And it clearly states that estates and farms should be notified, even if the house isn't within the 20 metre um, site. We'll get the officer to clarify that when we go into session, Andy. Any other questions for this young lady? In that case, thank you very much for coming Thanks. forward. And, and just retake your seat. We now have uh, Andrew Lightfoot, who's the applicant. Again, Andrew, you'll have three minutes, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Sorry. Afternoon, everybody. Our application to reinvent this derelict and decaying former dairy cottage into a modern home and garage and workshop was passed by Planning Department on the 8th of October 2015. Prior to clearing off the warrant, a few revisions were made to the garage drawings. Unfortunately, we did not follow up these in the Planning Department. The revisions included an access to the upper floor workshop. It became apparent that having sold her house in, the, in town much earlier in, than 
in our schedule than I anticipated. We would need space over and above the caravan we sleep in to store our house contents and also use as a site office and a sitting area. The amended plans were returned stamped approved on the 5th of June 2017 by Building Control. It was at this point we mistook approval from Building Control for the right to proceed. Our architect and ourselves have taken responsibility for this misunderstanding and we have both apologised to Beth Halliday and the rest of the planners. We genuinely did not intend any infringement of, our rule, of the rules or process. We are sincerely sorry for this mistake and would like to offer our full cooperation to meet any practical ways to address the situation and get on with our building, building our home. We have met all the planning conditions for the con commencement of works which have been questioned. Having read all the correspondence available on the Council website, we believe this hearing was instigated by our neighbour because of the frustration of his frustration at having to, to withdraw draw his own application to build a house on the estate being recommended for refusal. Whilst, whilst as individuals that we would have been impacted negatively by this application, we did not support it. We believe the planners have their own professional rationale for advising withdrawal of this application. We think it unfair to make comparison between the establish, establishment of an entirely new plot and house on agricultural land clearly visible from miles away and the relative minor amendment we have made in addition to existing permissions. You have 30 seconds to go. Lastly, I would like to reiterate that this building is a garage workshop store. It will never be a dwelling house. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for the applicant? Elaine? Yes, yes. Um, I understand you've been living in the, the property while you were doing up the, over the winter because it's warmer. I think the thing for me that worries me, I, 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 you know, it's not big enough to be a dwelling house, but it looks a little bit like it could be ancillary accommodation, a bit like a, you know, a spare room or somewhere it could stay if, they were, if you had visitors and that type of thing. And that, I think that's maybe the thing that's a bit worrying about it, that it looks as if it could be used for a purpose other than simply as a garage and workshop. Does it have sanitation or running water in it? Sorry, I've stopped this on. Uh, it won't be used as a house. Uh, sorry, what was your question again? It's not so much that it would be a separate dwelling house, because as Councillor Tate said, it's really rather too small to be a, a dwelling house. But it looks a little bit as if it could be used as ancillary accommodation, for example, for guests or whatever. Yes, I understand that. As was said before, I'm a joiner retired firefighter for 30 years and this was my dream to build this. I know I'm doing things back to front but because I need somewhere for my machinery uh, and to store our furniture upstairs just now. The upstairs will eventually become a craft room. Uh, I do wood turning. It will never be a house. That's all I've got to say. Is there a water supply in it? Is there yep. sanitation in it? Or? Yes, water has been passed. With regards to SEPA, we had to move the septic tank, conforming, we got a company in, Hutchison Environmental, they came in, uh, we did soil samples, they were not happy with the original position of the septic tank, and we had to conform with SEPA regulations, and that's why it was moved to the rear. I hope that answers your question. I've got Andy Juste and then Andy Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. My question has partially been answered. The applicant says that is a joiner, and I note that this uh, this development was to help support the rejuvenation of the current cottages. With the longevity of him being a joiner, will this building actually become a part of his business in the future once the cottage is developed, or what's the the purpose for it afterwards. This building is, I think it's written in the deeds when we wrote, when we moved in, that this will never be a business. It's hobby based. As I said, I'm a retired firefighter. 
part-time firefighter at Moffat. That's craft work. That's all it'll be used for. Thanks, Andrew. Andy? Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, earlier, somebody asked a question about the, the balcony, or whatever you want to call it. Um, what's the purpose of that? And I, I don't know if Beth can actually maybe move the slides back. Is there a slide shown on the other side? Um, as we look on the end, before you answer the question. No, there isn't one of the other side. There's um, questions for uh, the applicant, and we will get to Beth. Uh, no, 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 I, it is to help with that. That's what I'm saying. If we, I thought there was a picture looking at the end of the there building, is. right? Because what I'm looking at, I, if I remember correctly, there was no path up to where that veranda comes uh, um, to land away from the side of the building. No, the other yes. way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. If, if that's an access path, where's, if that's an access into the top path, where's the path that leads to it? I think you're asking the applicant that, aye. Can you answer that, sir? Where is the path that, that if that a balcony is intended in access to the upper floor, it doesn't appear that there's a path present to get you onto the balcony to get to the upper floor. Uh, there is a walkway up to the side of there. If you zoom in, you'll see it. Uh, obviously, I'm still making the gabion baskets to support the, the bank in just now. Uh, there is an internal staircase inside <coughs> leading to the top of the workshop, which was shown in the plans earlier on. So you're saying that, you're going to introduce gabion ba baskets to hold up the embankment to allow you to create a path up to the... That will help support it, yes. Uh, regarding the balcony, uh, it's a place for my wife to sit while we do the, the building work. It's not there for any other reason, just to give us a bit of, nice, a bit of space and access. Uh, I'm a firefighter. Got a wood burning stove up there. It's an escape route. Okay, thank you. And uh, that is, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I know you're the extra ten firefighter as well, Chair, and uh, I'm, I'm still struggling to find how, if you were using that as a fire escape, how you would actually get off it. Doing the pole, I absolutely, because I, I'm assuming the red bucket is a fire bucket as well. I'm a, I'm being a wee bit cynical here. I, I, th I think the applicant said it was somewhere to sit and relax where there was a fire escape. <coughs> so, if there are no other questions for the applicant, thank you very much for coming forward. Just to resume your seat again, sir. We are now in session. Ian. Thanks, Chair. Another interesting case. I've been quite interested today, haven't I? But taking all the material considerations into consideration, I'm certainly minded to, to go with the, the officer's recommendation. I see it's a retrospective. It's been explained out why that is. I don't have any, any issues at all with the current design. Uh, and I, I do believe it'll be a residential type of garage once the development's, uh, we've had the personal circumstance, the development's been completed and so on and so forth. So, uh, there may well be localized personal neighborhood disputes. There was an accusation of, uh, Almost maladministration, I would imagine. The only bit we do need clarified is that we had a, there was a, an advert in the press to say that, okay, there's an application going on here. But other than that, I would certainly move the recommendations as I presented think we to us. Word oversight rather than maladministration. No, I'm, that's my language, but I think it's, uh, I think we'll find that it's been, it's actually happened, taking place, so therefore, if it has, that's it. So, is that a proposal? Absolutely propose that, Chairman. I think we need clarified. Was an advert in the press that would allow the council to comply with the neighbour notification process? David, just to answer that question, I know for a fact the head of service has actually spoken to the objector about this. Basically, where I mean, she answered her own question by saying Drumcreef House is 75 metres away. You only need to notify where there is a residential property within 20 metres. Now. That's 75 metres away. It clearly isn't notifiable. However, where you do abut um, open land, you, there is a requirement to put an advert in the paper. That was done. And obviously, 
the objector did get a representation in. She has spoken at committee today, so there is no question of her rights being impinged then. So before we get into any discussion about that, because we're not, your move is to go with the officer's recommendation, Elaine. It was really, um, I still have a bit of a concern about how that looks. And that it could, I, don't, I know it can't be used as a dwelling house and there's a, a condition saying it cannot be. I just wondered whether we could tighten up that, con that condition so that it cannot be used as part of the <coughs> property. So it couldn't be used as a spare room or, or an over annex or an overfill overflow sort of area that it can we tighten up that condition I'm not necessarily saying that this gentleman wants to do that but this structure would be there in future he may sell it to somebody else who thinks that they can use it as a as a part of the property rather than as a, a, a garage and work shop so I just wondered whether we can tighten up that condition a bit I would agree with you but any condition we put in place must be enforceable and how we would go on we're getting random phone calls saying there's somebody living there for a fortnight or a weekend. I don't know. I mean, that's David's advice and that. But any condition we put in place has to be enforceable and it doesn't need to be, a, what's the word, prescriptive. Uh, Chair, it, it is a, a tricky one, but where you have um, an ancillary um, use to the dwelling house, which is clearly would be as a garage, um, it's not a million miles away where you get granny annexes, for example, on the same grounds. It would be the question of the reasonableness, because the wording here is just any purpose other than a purpose incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house as such. You could possibly put um, additional wording in saying, and for the avoidance of doubt, no residential uh, element shall be in there. But again, I would have to echo the, the words of the chair there about it, the, the enforceability of that. Um, but it could be done. Yeah, if that would make members happy. Um, I, just, just to say that I think that, you know, in terms of when, if the property was sold, if that is clear from the title deeds, then it would, uh, they, it would avoid doubt in future purchases, and so if something like that was actually included. Happy with that. Now, I take it to be happy with David's uh, language and for the avoidance of doubt uh, uh, introduced into the, the condition. Okay, I've got Andrew Juste and then I've got David McKee. Chair, I'm happy to second Ian Crowther's motion. Okay, Councillor McKee. <coughs> Chair, given you look at uh, 1.1, the previous application wasn't considered by us, it was withdrawn. And the applicant has gone ahead and done what he wanted to do, then come back for retrospective planning up a permission. Now that's, that's very concerning. It was due to come up before the planning committee and then it was withdrawn. That was an application for a house. And, and that applicant has now created a garage, uh, which is completely different. And again... Sorry, Chair, it's a different applicant as well. That, that application was from the objector. Archie. Thanks, Chair. I mean, if it's going to be a vote, I, I'll, I'll second Elaine's... Um, You're too late. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Elaine's. Well, I'll speak to the uh, the mover and the seconder if we get to that stage without any alternative proposals. Are there any? No, no yet. I'll, I'll ask you. Are there any other m members wanting to speak? If no, uh, Ian. Oh, Andy. Thanks, Chair, for letting me in. Um, I have a real problem with all, all these things because if this is a joiner. Right, who worked, um, yes, he was a firefighter, but he was also being a joiner, his, his words. He should know that he requires planning permission for stuff like this. And, and uh, doesn't it doesn't doesn't matter, Ian, I mean, I'm not going to get into semantics with you. At least he should have had an inkling that he should have asked somebody for advice at the very least. Um, and I... I I kind of have to agree with that bit of 1.1 as well. This looks more akin to a dwelling house than a domestic garage. Um, and, um, but I don't know how on earth... I, I'm not going to suggest the draconian thing would actually tear it down if we were to refuse plan, plan permission. That's crazy. But there has to be something in here that we make sure, because his, his own words here, he's been using it to sleep in and live in in the winter months. So he has been using it as a house. It's in, it's in the report. 
But officers have accepted that because he's also been given permission to occupy a caravan in the yard as a place to live whilst the renovation is being done. So this is a compensatory thing and it's also accepted it was temporary and that's in your report as well. So whilst it's a challenging one eh, and, and eh, it's maybe one officers need to be particularly aware or conscious of in the future because I'd love a garage like that, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 has, it has though. We have now arrived at a, a potential solution. Ian has put forward a motion, but then Elaine has added a, a part of condition number... Well, there's only one condition. Are you as a mover proposed a, a, a prepared to accept that additionality from Elaine, or does she have to put up an amendment? I think she probably have to put an amendment. I think what she's what she's proposing is unreasonable. I would go back to the points of the five tests, and I think it's no reasonable of, of a condition. So is it therefore enforceable? I think we would, we would be applying a condition that is unreasonable. It wouldn't be fair and consistent with the approach we take with the rest of the people in the Free and Galloway. So therefore, it's only a small thing she's asked for in real terms. But if it came to it, and for some reason somebody stayed at that they had, they had a, a, a home car, whatever it may be, and there was a, a Overcrowding of the house and two people wanted to sleep in that garage. All of a sudden, conflict uh, of a condition of planning, breach of planning condition. Yes, I'm not saying it's yeah. No, I'll just, I reckon, I ask Per what's stated from the case officer. Okay, so that's no, and Andrew, you're supporting Ian as well. In, word, in one word, yes. Good man. So, Elaine, do you want to put up an alternative motion? Yes, Close I will, on. and with the inclusion of the suggestion that uh, Mr. Sutty made. Do you have a second? In fact, my colleague here says that we could include the word permanent. permanent. Yeah. No so Archie waved his hand. Is it you, John Martin? That's second. And so, Elaine is a mover on amendment. Is seconded by John Martin that we add the words. David, what do we add? Well, this is the one I'm thinking through. It is quite complicated because we we know at the moment that it is being lived in. We don't know how long it's going to take them to get the garage, sorry, the house. Mm -hmm converted, I understand the, the objective is maybe a couple of years. So he would inherently be breaching that condition if we say there shall be no residential. Um, My, but, but, uh, Chancellor Martin has suggested it should be no permanent residential. Use. Well, that, that's what I was going to say. That was what I was just exactly going to say. If you wanted to say um, after the completion of Dairy Cottage, there shall be no permanent residential, then I'm quite comfortable with that. Yeah. You've got that, Lucy? Yeah. That word in? Yeah. Uh, Andy Ferguson wanted to come back in, did you? No, no, okay. Right, so we're going to go to the vote. Uh, we have a motion from Ian Carruthers, seconded by Andrew Juste, to go with the officer's recommendation. Yep. We have an amendment that go with the officer's recommendation subject to the addition to the condition of the wording. That after the completion of Dairy Cottage, the, there will be no residential use. There will be no permanent yeah. residential use. Mem members understand? And go to the vote. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Crothers. Motion. Councillor Jibra. Amendment. Councillor Fairbairn. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Justy. Motion. Councillor Lever. <coughs> Amendment. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Amendment. Councillor Tate. And I can confirm that the amendment carries by 10 votes to 4 and therefore the decision in relation to this item is to approve subject to conditions but with the ad added condition that after the completion of Dairy Cottage there will be no permanent residential use. 
Thank you, Lucy. Come to agenda item 10, and as I've declared an interest, I shall vacate the chair in respect to my colleague John Campbell. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, this is planning application uh, consultation regarding an application made under section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 for the proposed erection of 24 wind turbines, maximum height 125 metres to blade tip, electricity capacity of 81.6 megawatts, a meteorological mast, formation of new access to the A76 and improved access to the C125N, access tracks, water crossings and hard standings, installation of temporary construction compounds, site, substation and associated works at proposed Sandy Now wind farm site southwest of Kirkconnell and Kello Home. And the recommendations is to raise no objections. And we have Robert Duncan who will give us a presentation. Robert, in your own time. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, for the benefit of members, before I start, there is an error at the foot of page 143 of your papers. You will see it makes reference to the Glen Mucklock, the final bullet point makes reference to the Glen Mucklock proposal, which was the one you considered this morning, and obviously you are minded to grant permission to that subject conditions in a section 75 obligation. Turbine heights in that should, of course, be 149.5 metres and not 133.5. So if you can take note of that and the change status of that application now, that would be ideal. Moving to the first slide, this shows the general location. It's obviously a consultation from Scottish ministers in connection with an application they are entertaining. So they are the planning authority for the purposes of this case because the overall generating capacity of the scheme is in excess of 50 megawatts. Uh, they're entertaining it under Section 36 of the Electricity Act, and as host authority, we are a statutory consultee. Uh, comments, as is usual, and consultation responses from other parties are made directly to the Scottish Government's Energy Consent Unit, and they consider those in due course. This slide shows the general location of the application site that's on the southern side of the A76, Trunk Road, some distance away. You'll notice the two access points onto the A76. In terms of distance, it's about 6.9 kilometres to the west of Sankar. And looking at Kirkconnell, southwest of Kellaholm, is 2.6 kilometres away. The proposal, as is put forward today, has been described in the report at 1.6 as well. Now, I, I, I won't go through that, but, but what you're looking at is essentially something in, that is in physical terms similar to the previous planning application, but we'll come on to that. A slight journey into the planning history of this one, if you like. Um, the planning history is outlined in the report at 1.15. So we had a first Section 36 consultation response. That's application 12C30030. The layout for which you can see here, that was considered by Planning Applications Committee on the 24th, sorry, 25th of June 2014. And at that point in time, members were minded not to raise objections to that development. And that was obviously uh, the Council's formal response that Scottish Ministers took into account when they made their own decision. On the 18th of February 2015, they determined to refuse consent for this proposal. Now, the thing that's worth noting from this plan here is what we're looking at now is a scheme for 24 turbines and we'll come on to that layout but you had 30 here so the six that you can see at Libri Moor were deleted from the subsequent proposal you also had a slight change in the location of this and some of the other turbines and the access tracks but we'll come on to that there was then a planning application Reference 15P3279 was submitted this one for 24 wind turbines, each of these 125 metres base to tip. Um, registered as valid. As, as I've said, what you can see is the difference 
in the Libri Moor element of the proposal, and there are other changes within the site as well. <coughs> At this stage, 24 turbines were 2 megawatts each, and when you multiply that out, it was arriving at 48 megawatts. During the course of that application, we obviously did ask for confirmation of the turbine type, and we were told it was a Senvion turbine type. Now, this is something I took off Senvion's website earlier this week, so you may not be able to read this, but it's got the height rotor diameter 100 metres, hub height 75 metres to 100 metres. So this is of the scale that was envisaged at that point in time, and crucially, the nominal power was 2,000 kilowatts, which is 2, two megawatts for each turbine. So we were satisfied at that point in time there was such a turbine and the application was determined on that basis. Again, looking at 1.16 um, in the report, the members should note that planning permission 15P3279 as well has been granted subject to conditions and the Section 75 legal obligation by this council has now been acted upon and has been secured by virtue of a combination of discharge of the relevant planning conditions and the commencement of works on site in the meaning of the Act and also in relation to the planning permission itself. So you're now in a situation where planning permission, which we bring the previous slide back up, that planning permission has been secured as a fallback position which could be implemented instead of this proposal where it to gain consent. What I also did, I felt it would be useful to look at the differences between the previous proposal and this proposal. Um, obviously, one of the key things to look at is that prevailing circumstances are different at this point in time. So I've summarised this in six bullet points. Each turbine would now have a power rating of 3.4 megawatts each rather than 2 megawatts. Uh, so by my arithmetic, that means the generating capacity is now in the region of 81.6 megawatts. The present version of the Local Development Plan's Supplementary Planning Guidance Part 1 Wind Energy Development was the one adopted on the 22nd of June 2017. So we're now on to a different version of that than we were at the time that this 15P3279 application was determined. So that's a different circumstance than previously. Cumulative pattern of wind energy development decisions within 10 kilometres of this proposal has also changed, and I'll, I'll come on to that. Uh, but again, that's summarised in the background to the report. So circumstances are slightly different in that respect. The Council's also published its proposed plan for LDP2, and crucially, that contains a new spatial framework to address the acknowledged shortcomings of the adopted framework which exists in the present version of the LDP. You've also had two Scottish Government documents that have been published since the termination of this previous application, and that's the Onshore Wind Policy Statement, published December 2017, and the Scottish Government's Scottish Energy Strategy, also December 2017. So if we're looking at the pattern of approved development in the area, no, nope, skipped on too far. Each green triangle represents an approved turbine. Some of these have been implemented, some of them haven't. So in summary, you're looking at as far down as South Kyle there, Windy Standard 2, Windy Standard 1. Penclo and Afton. Uh, you also have Hare Hill, Hare Hill Extension at this location. The application site itself, the approved scheme obviously is 15P3279. You've got Sanker Community Wind Farm and its extension, <coughs> Whiteside Hill Wind Farm, 20 Shilling Wind Farm as well. To the north, you've got Lethens Wind Farm. You also have, well, there's, I suppose there's two there now, but that's the Glen Muckleth development. And you can. I'm getting ahead of myself. If you look at undetermined proposals, uh, what you're looking at here is Enoch Hill in East Ayrshire, then Ashmark Hill, which is the line. You've also got the Hare, Hare Hill case, that's a section 42 to extend the lifespan of those turbines in the Dumfries and Galloway area. You've obviously got the present application under consideration, this is an undetermined section 36 case. Billyside Wind Farm, long-standing wind farm with an ATS objection located there. We're expecting that to be withdrawn fairly soon, but that has yet to be confirmed. 
20 shilling undetermined section 42 application and in the distance we have the North Lowther's section 36 case and you've already already provided a consultation response on that due to go to PLI at some point this year. And finally, the refuse we've drawn applications in this area, the situation has not really changed. So you've got the original Lethens proposal which was withdrawn and that's been overtaken by other consent. The original section 36 consent, if you like, for Sandy now. So that's the 30 turbine scheme you've already seen, but that's obviously not what's under consideration here. And the application at Spangle, the original one at Sunnyside, and an application there at South Mains Farm, just at that location. So that gives you the, the, the picture as it stands today, if you like, which you need to take into account. In terms of the change since you looked at the previous application, Lethens is now approved, it was undetermined, and it's the same situation with Glen Muckler. Sanker 6 is Sanker Extension, and Penco in East Ayrshire. New applications that have come in, uh, Care Hill, it's undetermined at the moment, uh, that's the Section 42 application. Ashmark Hill is undetermined, the 20 shilling Section 42 application to create bigger turbines, if you like, again, is undetermined. And you've got the Glen Muckler proposal that you considered earlier. In summary, um, I think the key consideration in this case is the planning status of 15P3279 and the fact that's been acted upon and secured. Uh, this proposal obviously will physically replicate um, that, that scheme, notwithstanding the differences in the proposed candidate turbine type in terms of its electricity generating characteristics, meaning that more electricity would be generated overall from the same footprint, if you like. So, in summary, I would just draw members' attention to paragraph 4.26 of the report, and I've covered the physical characteristics of it. Uh, the latest version of the DGWLCS guidance, which I mentioned adopted June 2017, takes that permission into account as part of the cumulative situation, and I think that's important. <coughs> And whilst the concerns of the Council's landscape architect were echoed by officers in the recommendation made to members in respect of that planning application, it's now simply the case that the situation has moved on and it's considered that this proposal now forms part of the accepted baseline of cumulative wind farm development as set out within the DGWLCS. From my perspective, this carries significant weight in determining whether or not the Council would wish to raise an objection with Scottish ministers in relation to this proposal noting that such a decision to do so would trigger a public local inquiry prior to the final determination of the case by Scottish ministers. So, in summary, given the circumstances of the case, and again, noting the status of that planning application, I, I don't consider that it would be reasonable of the Council to raise an objection to this proposal when it shares the same physical characteristics. And on that basis, the recommendation is to raise no objection to the proposal as it's been presented. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, any members got questions? We've got Elaine and then Archie. It's not really so much of a question, actually, is it? And I think it's confirmed this will look exactly the same as the application already granted and which the applicant has already said that will go ahead if this doesn't get permission or if the Scottish Minister turn this down, the, um, the applicants will go ahead with the original application. Is that correct? Th that's correct. In fact, the applicant has already acted to secure the previous permission, so they have that permission in perpetuity now. Archie. <coughs> so, thanks very much, Chair. I mean, again, not, not so much a question. I think this has been, I think I've been at every one of these planning applications for this particular uh, um, site for that. I, I looked at <coughs> all, all of the issues previously. I, I see that the community has got great support for this. Robert's been working really hard on this one as well. The, the, the opportunity for, you know, our economic regeneration within the community with regards the things that are happening in Upper Nisdale are, are absolutely spot on and deal with the, the council's priorities in there. That ends here. It's a recommendation is to raise no objection, uh, objection, and I would go with that recommendation. Thank you, Archie. Andy? 
Um, uh, yes, and I think I maybe better ask Robert a question first. So effectively, what we're doing here is putting a more efficient machine on the, an existing permission. It's, it, it's going to increase the productivity and by that increase the community benefit to the, uh, the local the local scheme, yeah? We're looking at a bigger yield of electricity, yes, from the turbines. Uh, okay, in that case, I'm happy to second, Archie. Uh, we're not in session. This is just a question uh, sorry, for the case. I thought, actually, I thought he said we, I'm happy to go with the recommendations, is what he said. Uh, right, Andrew, do you stay? I was going to do the exact same in second archery. Well, if there's no more questions for the case officer, then we'll go into session. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a, uh, a proposal to go along with this, uh, seconded or third by Andrew just here. Yeah. Okay, agreed. Everybody in agreement. Thank you. And in relation to item 10, Members have agreed to go with the recommendations and raise no objection. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, members. We move on to agenda item 11, plan application for the erection of agricultural shed at McCubbin Farm, McCubbington Farm, Olga. Full application, reference number 18 stroke 1853 stroke full. Recommendations to approve unconditionally in the case of Mrs. Beth again, Beth Halliday. Beth, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> this application is for the erection of an agricultural shed at Upper McCubbington, Coldside Road, near Oldgirth. The reason it is before you today is because the applicant is an elected member of the Council, Mr. Bell. Slight correction there because I had put that he was directly related, but he is the applicant. <clears throat> uh, this is the location plan, although it's not a particularly um, easy one to see there, but the, the, um, the f photographs will hopefully show it a little bit better of where it is within the site. Uh, the, uh, uh, the shed is within the farmsteading, to the rear of the farmsteading. Um, members who were at the committee in September may remember that there was one up before you then that's just across from the site and that part in the, in the plan that's the gap in the middle of the two larger sheds on the, on the opposite side to the southwest of it. I again proposed elevations of the shed and again proposed elevations to the rear of the site and the floor plan. So just taking this from Coldside Road, just an overall view of the farm steading, where it sits within the, within the countryside. And again, the entrance from the actual access road. And in this, you can see the site to the right-hand side of the picture. And just coming a little bit nearer up to it again, you can actually see in this picture where the September application is being built at the time of me taking the site visit photos, you can actually see the, the roof structure. And then this is the actual site of the proposed shed adjacent to the existing buildings. Again, a better, better view of the September. And then again, just looking towards the southwest, just showing it in the context of the, of the hills to the background. The application is recommended for unconditional approval. Thank you, Beth. Any questions for the case officer? There are no representatives, so we are in session. Agreed. Unanimously agreed. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. A decision, Lucy, please. And in relation to item 11, members have agreed to go with the recommendations and approve unconditionally. And the last item, agenda item 12, is as usual, it's uh, an appeal decision for noting where the uh, committee decision is overturned. Happy to note. Thank you, members, for your attendance today. See you in a month.